one of the more controversial things that we can talk about in the body is this issue of tongues, speaking in tongues. The question is, and there are a couple of questions, what exactly are tongues? What is the definition of tongues? What we see in the Bible, is that what tongues are limited to or have they changed? Another question, are there different types of tongues? And then more importantly, most importantly, what is the purpose of tongues? Are there several purposes of tongues? Is there one singular purpose of tongues? And so what we want to do is we want to take our time and go through the Bible from beginning to end because this issue of what we think tongues might be for, how they've been used, what they were described as, meaning what the words that were used to describe tongues, what has it always been? Is there different? Are there different nuances? And so we want to take our time and go through that. And so this is going to be a fairly lengthy video. Now, before we get started, though, I want to make sure that this, this point is carried forward. Whatever your issue is, whatever your belief about tongues are, it's not a reason to separate, to divide over, to have fights and so forth. So if a person believes that you should speak in tongues, well, fine. If a person believes that you should not, if a person has different understandings, we're going to have differences of views. Now, there can be those that might take their view of tongues to an extreme and when I say by extreme, that is if a person were to say that if you do not speak in tongues and you are not saved, well, then that pop, that is a bridge too far. That is an extreme that we should not as a body tolerate. We'll cover the reason for that in a little bit. So I just ask that everyone, as we go through this, uh, be open minded. Me, I have changed my view on tongues actually a couple of different times. I've gone from over here um, believing in tongues the way that we see them today because the very first church that I was a part of was a tongue-talking church. As a matter of fact, before I even got into that particular church, uh, I was part of this ultra-charismatic view. And so my view of tongues kind of changed a little bit. I went from from there to having kind of a, uh, a different view about tongues, kind of coming back to tongues, and then ultimately landing in the position that I am today. And so even though someone might think, well, Corey, you're not very uh, open to being wrong on tongues. I have changed my view on tongues enough times. And so I've been open and I still am open. And so what I've learned to do is to just govern myself according to the text, what the history of the text has said. In other words, what we see in the text, not so much what people, different scholars believe, although we do take into account what they believe. And so when we look at this, I want us to be open minded. Let's look at what God is doing, because it's possible that all of us could be wrong, one of us could be wrong. And so I want to look at the text, see what it says. And so therefore, I want to start from the very, very beginning where we first see these differences in languages. And what I, before I go there, I want to go to, to Lagos and I want to look at something for real briefly. I want to go over here and I want to look at tongues and I want to look over here at the very, at the top right hand corner. And as we look at tongues, we see this little, this little, this little circle here. As we go down a little further, I want to look at the uh, the times that tongues are used in the Bible in the Old Testament. So I want to click on here. And as we see, we're going to see different passages that pop up. There are 104 times that this Greek word for tongues is used as well as the Hebrew word. Now, I shouldn't say the Hebrew word. There are different words that are used in the Hebrew, but I want to look at the Greek word for a particular reason. When I look at the Greek that we have what's called the Septuagint or the LXX, which is the Greek interpretation or the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. Remember, the Jews were taken into captivity and over the course of time, they began to lose their language. It was not a, a lost language, but there was a time where by and large, most Jews did not speak Hebrew. They spoke the language of their captors. And so we have these people, these uh, Jewish scholars that would come primarily for the library in Alexandria, which was a Greek library, to have a copy in the Greek translation. So these elders, these scholars would go and they would translate from the Hebrew to Greek. And so we have uh, their understanding, these Jewish scholars, their understanding what these Hebrew words meant. And so that's why I want to look at this word because it's the exact same word that we see show up in the New Testament. This Greek word for uh, glossi or glossa. And I want to also, if you notice, it's, there's also the Hebrew word. It corresponds with the Hebrew word, which is the Hebrew word for Lashon. And so we're going to look at that. And so one of the first passages that we see this show up is in Genesis 10.5. And so he says, from the coastlands of the nations were, were separated into their lands 
everyone according to his language, according to their families in their nations. And so what I want to do, I want to go back over here to this other software over to, to Accordance and pull this passage up. And let's go to where uh, here we are in Genesis 10, 5. Same same um, reading. And the word that's used here for language is the word lason. Now, let me move this, the Hebrew over and let's put the Greek up. I want you guys to see what the Greek is. And so the Greek we see here is the word for language or the Greek word uh, glosan. Now, the reason why that's important is because we're going to keep seeing this word glosan. Now, let me just stop for a second. Glosan or glosa or glosize. The endings don't let those bother you because they're going to change it. They're, they're, we have derivatives of it to, so they can meet uh, certain grammatical standards. Uh, the different case endings, or if a word is a verb, you're going to have different endings and so forth to uh, to uh, verify the tense. So if it's a if it's aorist tense, past tense, if it's a present active indicative, things like that. So you're going to see some some different augmenting in the beginning or the last few letters might change. But, but as long as we know we're talking about the same word, and so. This word is used often throughout the scriptures, so we need to understand what that word means. Now, in this case, as we put it back on the screen, this case, the word gloson is referring to language. And we see what it means by language. Everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. And so we see that people are speaking different languages. OK, now what's interesting, if we go back, if we go a little further from Genesis, I'm sorry, we go to Genesis 11, we see this being spoken of. And so it's interesting. It seems as though there may have been languages previous, different languages previous to the um, the Tower of Babel. Here we have the Tower of Babel happening and we've got these people that are in, that are speaking these different languages. And I want to go to the very beginning of this. Because the Bible says now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And so this could be kind of a recap of what was happening in verse 10. And I'm sorry, in chapter 10. But he says the word that's used here is the word, not the same word, um, the Hebrew word for uh, Lashon. This word is the word for Sapap, which is for the word lip. And so the word that's used here. It, even in the Greek, it's not, as a matter of fact, let me move this over. I want you all to see the word that's used here in the Greek. The word that's used here in the Greek is the word xilos, which is not the same word for glosos. But understand, we're still talking about people who have the same sort of speech. And so going back to it, it says, now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And so now this should be taken as their language. So we have, we have different words that refer to language. Uh, and so as long as we understand kind of the context, that shouldn't be too difficult for us. That shouldn't that shouldn't cause too much of a problem. Uh, but it's just that when we see this word glossos or glos, glossize, uh, we want to see the different ways that it's used. We're going to find that it's only used two different ways. And so here we see Genesis 11. One. Let's keep reading. Uh, excuse me. Now it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said, uh, to one another, come, let us make baked bricks and burn them thoroughly. So they're going to build this, this tower. We already understand this. And so I want to drop down a little further. Verse five, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And the word that's used here is the same word that's xilas in the, in the Greek, uh, in the Septuagint, and the same word in the Hebrew, uh, sapath, which is so we're not seeing the, the word for glosos yet or the Hebrew word lashon. We haven't seen that yet. But we're going to verse 70 says, come, let us go down and confuse there. Now we see uh, the Greek word. Let me move this over. I want you guys to see this. The Greek word that's used here is the Greek word for glosan. And so we see this word. Let's confuse their language. And so this seems to understand, to be understood as uh, a recognized language, the different types of language with some sort of understanding. The reason why we say that is because he says, let us go down there and confuse their language. OK, let me move the Hebrew back over here because I want that to be. Uh oh, I want that to uh, I want to keep using that for for the time being. Then what's interesting, though, he says, so so the Lord came down or the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. Therefore, the place was called Babel because the Lord confused their language. Now, it goes back to the word Zile, which is not the word glosos, 
so, so it goes back to it. So these two words seem to be interchangeable. But again, we're focusing on the word glosas. Now, I want to point out something. This issue of language, obviously, these people can't communicate because they are speaking different languages. But remember what God was after all along. God was after them, as he says, be fruitful and multiply upon the face of the earth. And they weren't doing that. As a matter of fact, we've got sinful people, but God wants to um, share or move and to promote his glory upon the face of the earth. They weren't doing that. They wanted to instead promote their own glory. And we see that in Genesis 11. So God uses this confounding of their languages to be what causes them to separate and move about the earth. Now, they're not spreading his glory, but God is going to take care of that in due course. Now, I want to go to a passage that I think is also interesting as well. We're going to start looking at some of these words uh, dealing with uh, matter of fact, let's let's do that first. Let's go go back over here to to Lagos, and we see some of the words that are brought up here, or some of the verses here. Genesis ten five, which we read. Genesis ten twenty. Here we see the word also used here. These are the sons of Ham, according to their families, according according to their languages, according to their language. We see the exact same thing. And if you look at the bottom, you see the Greek highlighted the word glosse. And so this word is still used there as well. There are other passages that we go to that don't necessarily use this in the same sense as a language. It might be used to identify a particular type of people. Uh, so, for example, in, in uh, Exodus eleven seven, we see the word glossize is used or the word or the word is used here. Uh, it, let me move down just a little bit further over here, if I can find exactly where this is in the Greek. I'm reading this. Okay, here we have it here. So over here we have, um, uh, if you look at the bottom, the middle, you see it says, uh, for they were speaking languages. As a matter of fact, I'm sorry, this is still First Corinthians 14. Let me let me click let me click on this passage so it can show up over here. Uh, let's see, there it is, there it is. Okay, I have it here. As a matter of fact, I'm sorry, look at the bottom right corner where you can see this word being used here. And here we've got an issue. So let's go to, to Exodus 11, 7, back over here in accordance. I want to pull this up. I want you guys to see this uh, in Exodus 11, 7. And I want you to see what's interested here. What's, what's been interesting here, Exodus 11, 7. And the word that's used here, we've got, uh, but, it, but against the sons of Israel, uh, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Israel, I'm sorry, between Egypt and Israel. Now, what's interesting is the word that's used here, if I can find it, the word for bark that is used here is the Greek word glossize. And so a dog will not even bark or give his language or t so the word that's used here for bark is actually the word for language it's actually in still the hebrew word lashon as a matter of fact let's move this over so you guys can see that as well the hebrew if i can move, make this do this better uh-oh so the hebrew word that's used here for bark is the same the same word uh for tongue which is the word lashon and so we see that certain words are used they're using kind of tongue in cheek in the English, but the word lashon or glossize is the word that's used there. So the English in this case kind of confuses it, but he says, but against any of the sons of Israel, uh, a dog will not speak whether against men. Now we use the word bark because that's what dogs do, but he's speaking against people who are not of Israel and calling them dogs, which we see this later on in the New Testament as well. But the word that's used there is literally the word for speaking a particular language. Okay, let's go back to, uh, to, to Lagos. There's other passages where we see this pop up as well. Uh, let's go to Joshua 7.21. When I saw the, the among the beautiful, I'm, I'm sorry, when I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, and I covered them. Well, wait a second. Where is language in this? So let's go to back over here to Joshua 721. Let's type this in here. And let's see what pops up. 721. Because I want to, again, see how this is used here. Let's put the Greek back over here. 
And where is the word glossos in this bar of gold? So that's interesting. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels. Now, why is this word bar used there? Why is, I'm sorry, not the word bar, but the word glow sign used there? Well, the reason for that, if you look down at, at the very bottom, look below me, you can see the definition says that uh, this is, it means tongue, language, bar in God. So in other words, this kind of helped. If you think about a bar of gold and you think about a tongue. So the tongue is used kind of as a symbol or not as a symbol, but kind of as a, if you think of what a, what a tongue looks like, that's what this bar of gold, gold looks like. And so the reason why I'm bringing this up is because there are two ways that the word tongue or glossi is used. It means either a language but now there can there can be it can be used metaphorically as a figure of speech, such as what we just saw regarding uh, speaking about a dog using a language, but then you would call it a bark, metaphorically speaking. Same thing here. The other use of the word tongue or glossi is for the actual member of your mouth, the tongue. And it's used metaphorically uh, as a tongue of gold uh, or a bar of gold because of the shape of the bar, the shape of a tongue. And so when you see that, that's why it's used in that regard. It's kind of interesting to see that. And so let's go back to, back to Lagos. And so I want to move to where the other passages, there, there are so many other passages, but there are times where it's used in terms of something as, as a figure of speech or as literal. So in this one, this is 2 Samuel 23, 2. The spirit of the Lord spoke by, by me, and his word was on my tongue. Well, in this case, how is it used? It's used as the vessel in the mouth, the, 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 the member of a person's mouth. And so if we were to go through all of the scriptures, all of the Old Testament passages, we're going to see it used one of two ways, either as the member of the mouth or metaphorically to refer to one singular, something that looks like it, like a bar of gold. And that's really one of the only times that I've seen it used that way. And so sometimes we have, even in English, we have words that are used metaphorically. We don't, it doesn't literally mean that, but it refers to something kind of to bring about a picture in our mind. So this bar of gold or a tongue of gold is, is actually the, the literal rendition. This tongue, a tongue of gold, that doesn't make sense to us. And so how would we say it in English? We would say a bar of gold because he's referring to one bar. Or the other way that's used is for a language. And every time that we go through the scriptures, as we look through this, we keep seeing it used as either uh, an actual speaking language. So the very first time that we see that in Genesis 10, 5, uh, also in Genesis 10, but then also again in Genesis 11, we see the word, if it's not referring to the actual tongue in someone's mouth, it's also referring to um, the member, I'm sorry, or an actual language. And so I think it's vitally important if we are going to have um, to, to be able to have a conversation about this, we have to have an understanding of what the words mean. So going back to uh, back to Lagos and looking at, let's say, Song of Solomon, chapter four, verse 11, the word is used there. Your lips, um, bride, my bride, drip honey, honey and milk are under your tongue. So what's speaking of? Speaking of an actual tongue, the member of someone's mouth. The same word is used in Job. It's used to refer to someone's tongue every time an actual tongue and their tongue stuck to their palate. So what are we speaking of? The member. So it's either, again, the member in their mouth or a language. Let's move a little further. Let's, let's look at, at uh, Hosea 7, 16. They turn, they turn, but not upward. They are like deceitful bow, like a deceitful bow. Their princes will fall away by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. The insolence of their tongue. So uh, their mouth flapping, their insolence of it. The instance of their tongue is what he's speaking. He's speaking about the member of their mouth. Let's go to Micah 6, 12. Uh, For the rich men of the city are full of violence. Her residents speak lies and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. So again, speaking about what's in their mouth. Let's drop down a little further. Um, there are other occasions. Let's see. Let's find where we see them speaking about different uh, languages. Thus says the Lord of hosts. And in those days, 10 men from all the nations will grasp a garment of a Jew saying, let us go 
with you, for we have heard that God is with us. Now, where is the word tongues in here? Well, the word here for tongues is, as a matter of fact, let's put Zechariah 8.23 up on the other screen, because I want you all to see this a little bit clearer. Zechariah 8.23, let's type that in. And so where is the word tongue here? The word for tongue is used here in for the word language. The interesting thing is, let's look at this. In those days, 10 men from all the nations uh, will grasp the garments of Jews, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So then where is this word? Now, what's interesting, what's interesting is, uh, if I can find it, there it is. So where it's used for all of the nations, the literal, the little translation is, all of the languages of the nations. If you can see this, this word, pason, tone, glasson, tone, ethnon. So where we see the nations, what's missing in the English is all of the nations, all the languages of the nations. And we see that even, let's move the Hebrew over here so you can see that as well. I think that part would be important as well. So if we look to, uh, where is it? Here it is. Uh, same thing here. The word for goyim is for the ethnos, for nations, but then this word here for tongues, here it is. It's not shown in the English, but in the Hebrew, it's also there as well. All of the languages, the word lashon, uh, ha goyim. So we see it also, also the languages of the nations going back to Lagos. And so it, it should be clear every time we keep seeing the word used here in the Old Testament, whether it be the Hebrew word for Lashon or the Greek word for glossi or glasson, it still refers to one of two things, either the member of the mouth or it refers to an actual language, a language that's understood. So when we see that that word is being used in Genesis 11, God confounds and he uses it in, in the middle of it, uh, glossas, glossan, he's confounding their understanding of their languages. They no longer have the same lip, the same understanding. He has confounded that. And so that part is important to understand what God has done, or, or I'm sorry, not what God has done, but the use of this word. Vitally important because we can miss that. So, so far as we look at it, the, the meaning of the word means language or it means the tongue, the actual tongue. It can refer to, uh, and then by the way, each word can be used metaphorically, but it's still referring back to um, the member of the mouth or natural language to describe something else. Okay, so I want that part. That part should be, I hope that part is understood. Now, what God is ultimately wanting to do, and, and the point is what languages do is to convey to someone else something. When we speak, we are conveying something. That's the whole point, the whole purpose of language. And every language, there are rules to it. There's, gramma there's grammar, there's syntax. And so depending upon what language you speak, uh, there are still rules to it, even if it's a, a, a sophisticated language or even if it's a hodgepodge of various other languages such as English. There are still rules to our languages or to us speaking. Now, as we go forward, something interesting that's brought up in, in he, I'm sorry, in Hebrews, in, in the Old Testament regarding someone speaking to someone. And I think this part is, is, is vitally important as well. Something that Moses says that I don't think we give enough attention to, and I think we ought to. In Numbers 29, uh, matter of fact, let's go back a little further. Uh, let's go to verse 27. Verse 27, so a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Now, understand what he's saying, what prophesying in the camp. And to prophesy is just to tell, to utter, to give information. There are different types of prophets. You can be a lying prophet. You can be a false prophet. You can be a prophet of Baal. You can be a prophet of God. Uh, a, or a prophet of someone to prophesy or to, pro to be a prophet, you are giving information from someone else by or through because of someone else. That is important. As a matter of fact, before we go there, we understand that because when God says, when he's speaking to Moses, Moses is saying, I am not eloquent of speech. And so what is God's, what is God's remedy? He says, then the Lord said to Moses in, in Exodus 7, 1, then the Lord said to Moses, 
See, I make you as God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you and your brother Aaron shall speak to Moses. And so him as a prophet, what is he doing? He is going to inform Pharaoh what Moses tells him to say. In other words, he's going to utter, inform, tell, to reveal. That's what a prophet does. He tells. So go back to Numbers eleven twenty nine. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses from his youth said, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. So those other men that are telling, that are informing, that are prophesying, go and restrain them. Look what Moses' response is. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. The reason why this is important is because we're going to find out that this is pointing to the future about what God ultimately is going to do. That people, other people, not just one person or two people or three people, other people are going to tell of the Lord. As he says, would that the Lord's people, now he's speaking of all of his people, would that the Lord's people were prophets. Matter of fact, he says, would that all the Lord's people, because he used the word call in the Hebrew, which is the word for all, each or every, and am, which is people. So all of the people that they would be, that they were prophets, that that the spirit of the Lord, I'm sorry, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. What is going to happen in a few thousand years? The spirit of the Lord is going to come upon man and then mankind, those of his people would also give a revelation. Not to say that they would function in the role of a prophet, not to say that they, they would all be prophets in that office, but they would prophesy, they would give a revelation, they would tell. So now, that part, let's put that to the side, we're going to come back and we're going to revisit that, that the Lord would put his spirit upon mankind and they would prophesy, not to be prophets or to even, as we will find out later, have this gift of prophesying but they would just tell, they would inform, they would utter the words of God, they would reveal the words of God, not again, not being in the role of a prophet, because we've got these men here who are prophesying, but these men are not prophets. We see this happen before. In other places, we see uh, people such as Saul, who is not a prophet of God, but the spirit of the Lord comes upon him. And what does he do? I'm talking about King Saul, he prophesies, and so that can happen. Looking at a place like 1 Samuel 10, 6, then the Spirit of the Lord uh, will come upon you mightily, and you shall prophesy with them and be changed into another man. So who's he speaking of? He's speaking of Saul. He'll be changed to another man. He's not going to become a prophet, but he's going to be among the prophets because he's going to prophesy. Now the Spirit of the Lord will leave him. And then we won't see that. As a matter of fact, looking here in Nehemiah 930. However, you bore with them for many years and admonished them by your spirit through your prophets. And so he's going to use his prophets. Now, here's he speaking about using an actual prophet, admonishing or speaking to the people through your prophets, his prophets of old, his prophets of, of that, that day, and even moving forward. Now, remember, in order to give a true revelation from the Lord, it has to be that the spirit moves upon you. And so now notice this passage in 2 Peter 1.20. He says, but know, this is Peter, but know this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture. Now, is he speaking of an actual prophet speaking in the field somewhere? Well, no, in this case, this is actually the, he's referring to the written word. How does he refer to the written word? Prophecy of scripture is, a, he says, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation for no prophecy. Now he's speaking of all inclusive. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human, of human will, but moved by the Holy Spirit. They did what? They spoke from God. And so in this case, those Old Testament prophets, where they wrote it down or they spoke verbally, they were moved by the Spirit and they did what? They spoke. And so when a person has the Spirit upon them, whether in the office of a prophet or just uh, a lay person, they can still give or they can still tell, they can still inform, they can still utter, they can still reveal something of God. Not necessarily uh, the same, the person that's in the office of a prophet 
it works differently than the person who is just a regular lay person. For example, Saul, as he would prophesy, much different than, let's say, Samuel, who was a prophet of God. The Lord is literally speaking to him and, and guiding him to lead his people. We might talk about later on the prophets in the first test. I mean, the first testament in the New Testament, uh, the first century church, those particular prophets. But I think it's vitally important to understand when we talk about um, prophets, prophecy that's going to come up as it relates to tongues. And so we haven't really gotten to the point what the purpose of tongues are. Are there different types of tongues? The only thing that we can say in regard to different types of tongues, if we're talking about how the, how the word tongues is used, is all we can refer to, all we can think about is the way it was used in the Old Testament, the word, how it was used. We see it meaning either, again, the tongue or languages like English, like French, like German, or in their case, um, the, how the Jews would speak, their language of the Jews, or the language of the Egyptians, which we literally see him speaking that way, the language of different people. And so, so far, so far, all we have is two ways of doing so. So if a person were to enter into reading the New Testament after having read all of the Old Testament, and when they come across this word for tongue, they already know there's only two words. There's only two meanings. And so do we have the ability to come back and then maybe change the meaning? Now, the meaning of a word can change. That 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 can happen. But if we're going to change it, if we're going to say, well, there's a different meaning for the word, uh, there's got to be some sort of justification for that. There's got to be something that we can point to. And unfortunately, what, I, what I've seen happen is that people will change the meaning without any biblical justification. As a matter of fact, not even pointing to a justification. What has happened also when you look in, even when you look at certain lexicons, the lexicons will offer or allow for this third understanding, this third definition of tongues, meaning some sort of ecstatic um, language, unknown language. The problem is when you go and look at that, we, one, we don't have any other examples. They can't cite uh, other examples, except for this. The only time that we can see them citing examples of someone speaking about a tongue, meaning in an unknown fashion, is it someone who may be out of their mind saying something and nobody has any clue, any idea, and that person is not to be seen as sane. Um, but when we look for examples, we have no biblical examples of someone speaking in an unknown language that's understood only by that person or by God or only by God. We don't see that Anywhere else, even when the lexicons refer to it as a possibility, the examples or justifications for that is light. It's just that they're just really, I think, out of a courtesy allowing for that possibility, but they are allowing for that possibility with no real biblical examples, no real, really, truly no real extra biblical examples. When I say extra biblical examples, I mean uh, by writings of other folks that have nothing to do with the Bible. Maybe someone wrote a book. Someone wrote a letter, someone wrote a menu, a wedding invitation, things like that. We just don't see that word used. And so all we can surmise from the extra biblical information that we have, as well as the biblical information, specifically the biblical information, we don't see the word used in any other fashion except for being uh, an actual language or someone's tongue, the member of someone's tongue. The reason why that's important is because as we go forward, we need to see or have an agreement on words. If we can't agree, have some sort of agreement on the words, what they say, what they mean, it's going to be hard for us to communicate, pun intended. We can't communicate if we don't agree on what these words mean. So uh, one of the passages that are, that, that are brought up is going to be in the book of Job. I'm sorry, not the book of Job, the book of Joel. And I'm, I'm fixing my screen because I, I want us to see this. I think this, this is important. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, Peter gets up and he speaks. I'll come back more to what Peter's saying, why he's saying it, but he references Joel 2. And so we've covered this in the past, so I, I, I'll give a little bit of information towards this. Joel is speaking in Joel 2.28. He says, it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and daughters will prophesy, not become prophets, but they will prophesy. That's the verb. 
Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. So he says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit. In those days, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth. Now, he's speaking in this case regarding the end times, but we see the beginning of this happening in Acts 2. The question is, why is he doing so? But before we go to why he's doing so, remember what we read in Numbers eleven twenty nine and other places. When the spirit comes upon them, then what will happen? They can then prophesy. The question, though, since we understand that when the spirit comes upon someone, they can prophesy even if they're not a prophet, doesn't say the spirit will come upon them and they will become prophets, just as the spirit will come, will come upon them and they will prophesy okay understand the difference between the office of and the verb for example i can go and cook but that is and i can go in the kitchen and cook something that make me professionally as a cook i can go play basketball um, as a verb but as a noun me being a basketball player that's not what i am i can go um shoot uh, an arrow but i'm not a uh, what's the word <laughs> Uh, a hunter or not a hunter, uh, whatever the word is. I'm, my, my mind is uh, losing my train of thought in terms of what a an archer. I'm not an archer, even though I go out and shoot a bow and arrow once or twice. So the spirit comes upon them and they will prophesy, not necessarily be in a state of prophesying, but they will prophesy, they will utter, they will tell. The question is, what will they tell? Why will they tell? And then also important or germane to this conversation is, what does it sound like? What does it look like? And so we want to deal with that as well. So the, the next time that we hear anything about these tongues or these languages, or more importantly, the spirit come upon someone, because we, we, under, we understand that when the spirit comes upon mankind, what are they going to do? They are going to what? They're going to prophesy. They are going to tell. They're going to utter. They're going to bring about some sort of revelation. Right. So as they bring about some sort of revelation, if I can fix my um, if I can fix my screen here, I'm trying to fix something over here. There it is. Uh, and then go back to here. All right. Here we go. So they're going to want to tell some of the reason. There's, there's a, the question is, why? What is going on? Well, let's go back to uh, the New Testament and let's look at something that Jesus is saying. And I think this is important. In John 15, Jesus is telling his disciples what is going to occur, what is going to happen. He is going to be betrayed by man. He is going to die. He's going to be buried, resurrected. Now, he's not giving them full detail right now, but he's giving them um, a, a glimpse of it, an understanding of what's going to happen. And he says it in John 15, 26, when the helper, we know who that is, that is the Holy Spirit comes whom I will send to you from the Father. That is the Spirit of truth. He will proceed from the Father. Well, what have we already been told when the Holy Spirit comes? What will happen? We've seen this being told. And even Moses says, how great would it be? Would that the Lord would, would put his spirit upon all man, all of his people, and they would prophesy. So look what he says here. Look what Jesus says. That is the Spirit of truth. Who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. So what are they going to do? According to Jesus, when the Spirit comes upon, and you can just say this for the disciples, that's fine, but we know it's going to be to more than just the disciples, but for him, he says, when the Spirit comes upon them, they will do what? They will testify of Jesus. They will magnify or they will witness of him. Does he say in what words they're going to say something, yeah, I guess, verbatim? They'll say the exact same thing? No, because even when the prophet spoke, they might have had the same message, but not have been delivered the same way or have used the same words. And so we're going to see this testimony, this testifying of Jesus in various ways. That necessarily brings about a problem. Well, what's the problem? The problem is twofold. One, we have people who don't speak the same languages. Paul, I'm sorry, not Paul, but these disciples, Peter, John, James, 
Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, they, they speak their common language, but these aren't sophisticated, educated men to, to the point to where they can speak all of these various different languages. Could they possibly understand maybe another language? Possibly. The lingua franca of that day was Greek. The majority of people in first century Jerusalem, Israel, spoke Greek. There were Jews that spoke Hebrew, but the majority spoke the language of their captors, which was Greek. But however, they would hear Hebrew. So there might have been those that understood Greek and Hebrew. You don't have to be very educated to have to understand two languages. There are people here who are not educated who might understand English and French. There are people who aren't. And when I say uneducated, I don't mean that they're not, that they're ignorant. I mean, that they haven't um, spent time in certain universities and colleges to learn it. You've got people who speak English and Spanish. So they may have understood English and English. They may have understood Greek and Hebrew or Greek and Latin since their captors, the, the, lingua, uh, the dominant language of the Roman citizen, those in Rome would have been Latin, but they would have, un they may have understood Latin and Greek and Hebrew or one or the other, or maybe just one. The point is though, if you are going to testify of, of him, you can only do it in one locale if you only got that one language, but how are you going to do it in other places where they don't speak Greek or Hebrew or Latin? You, if you're going to, you, if you're going to speak this language or speak testify of Jesus, you've got, you can only do it in the language that you know. And why that's important is because in Acts, if we go to it, uh, before we get there, let's before I go to Acts 2, uh, let's go to Acts 1. Before I go to Acts 2, let's go to Acts 1. And Jesus makes a statement here. Uh, as after his resurrection, the disciples are told to go see him. And they meet him. And what does he say? And let's start in verse 3. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convictions, convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So what is Jesus telling them? The things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for uh, what the father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. Well, when do they hear this from him? Well, they heard this from him in John 15. Uh, John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is preparing them for his impending death. And he tells them that the Holy Spirit will come upon them, will lead them. He will not only be in on them, but in them and that he will be with them forever. So he's telling them in Acts one, this is getting ready to happen. Now they asked, they said, John, um, Jesus makes a statement. Uh, John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days hence or from now. So what they are going to receive is this baptism of the Holy Spirit and what are, what's going to happen? Well, they ask him, well, Lord, is it going to be at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom? Well, no, but this is going to be the kind of the beginning stages of it, which leads us to the other problem. There, I, I said there's two problems when they speak or when they're going to testify of Christ. Two problems that are there. One, everyone doesn't speak the same language. Two, you've got people who, are, who hate other people. You've got Jews who don't like Samaritans, Samaritans who don't like Jews, Jews and Samaritans don't like uh, 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 Gentiles, Greeks, and vice versa. You've got people of different regions, different places who do not like Jews, who don't like each other. That's kind of the world that they lived in. And truth be told, a little bit of the way the world that we live in. And so why is that important? Well, God has to fix that. Is God concerned about fixing that? Well, let's go back to Acts uh, one, and he says, it is not for, you know, the time epochs, which the father has fixed of his own authority. So this restoring of the kingdom to Israel, remember this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven is likened to salvation. And it's not going to just be Israel. How do I know that? Well, the problem that we're also speaking of, if we go to Deuteronomy 32, God says to his people, Israel, that they have made him jealous with what is not a God. They have provoked him to anger. And so what does he say in verse 21? So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Well, who is the foolish nation? Well, the foolish nation is the Gentiles. And so what is God's promise to deal with, to, to bring this back? Paul reiterates this in Romans 11. I say then they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. Speaking of Israel, 
Did Israel fall? Was there stumble? Was their fall complete? No. He says, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them, that is Israel, jealous. So what is God trying to do? God is going to, he gives the oracle, he gives these words to Israel. And the first people that are going to be saved are going to be Jews. But soon thereafter, you'll see an influx of Gentiles coming in. What happens? Well, the Jews, by and large, turn their back on their Messiah, though the first converts, the first believers were Jews. But the majority at the time end up being Gentiles. Well, what's happening? Well, this is where God has stated that he is going to use these Gentiles to make the Jews just. And he says that later on, we won't go to it, but a spirit of stupor has been given, a partial hardening has been given to, to the Jews, to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So he's once he's through dealing with Israel, I mean, through dealing with the Gentiles, he is going to turn his attention to Israel. The issue is, though, how is Israel going to be saved? Well, if we go to Romans 10, he speaks about them needing someone to preach, someone to give it to them. And so someone's going to have to tell them, well, when the spirit comes upon you, what will you do? You will tell, you will give a witness, you will testify, you will inform, you will utter. In other words, you will prophesy. The word that's used here is the word prophetuete, which means to tell, to utter, to give a revelation. Now, does it mean that you're going to be a prophet? Do all people that prophesy, are all people that prophesy prophets? No, all people that prophesy are not prophets, but now all prophets prophesy, but it's possible that a person can prophesy and not be a prophet. This is what's happening. Why is it happening? For a couple of reasons. One, to magnify Christ. And truth be told, that's really kind of the overarching thing to magnify Christ, to, to, to give a test of, test of, to testify of Christ, um, to give a witness of Christ. And in doing so, a couple of things are going to happen. People who aren't even Jews are going to hear this gospel and place their faith in Christ. But again, they're going to have to do it in their language. But then also, uh, it is going to be a sign to Israel to do what? One, to convict them. Um, two, to make them well, to make them jealous, first of all. And then in making them jealous, it's going to convict them. So it's going to be a sign of judgment to them. Just what God said, that he's going to use a foolish nation uh, that's not Israel to make them jealous. And ultimately, Israel is going to come back to her Messiah. So what we're, what we're going to see is Jesus at the first sending them out. So let's go back to Acts in Acts 1. They ask, well, is this, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom? No. He says, but you will receive power or the ability when the Holy Spirit comes, comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. What we've seen him spoke of or what the Lord spoke of in, in Genesis, in Numbers and other places that the Spirit comes upon you and you prophesy. You will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So now he tells them what they're going to do. Um, now, we should also be able to see the why. The why in what he's doing uh, is clear. God, as, as Jesus makes his point in John 10, that he is going to take the two and make them into one flock and he is going to shepherd the two as one flock. So he's going to ha he's got sheep of another fold, as he says in John 10, 16, not Jews, the Gentiles, because Paul tells us that there is this mystery that is now being revealed. He, he gave some allusion to it in the Old Testament, but it's now being fully revealed that Gentiles also have a part, have a place in this, in this salvation. As a matter of fact, let's go back to the Old Testament. I want to pull up a passage really briefly, Revel not Revelation, Genesis Genesis 12, this was always the plan. So let's go back to it. Uh, in verse two, he says, speaking about Abraham and his nation, which is going to be Israel, Israel, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Verse three is the important part for us who are not Jews. And I will bless those who bless you and I will curse and the one who curses you, I will curse. And here it is. And in you, all the families of of the earth will be, will be blessed. So all of the families or each of the family or every family shall be blessed. Does that mean that everyone who is 
uh, alive will be blessed. Not everyone, but every type of family, each family. So every ethnicity, every nation, every group, every people group, whether you be um, Samaritan, whether you be um, whether you be of, uh, of Rome, whether you be French, whether you be German, whether you be Chinese, whether you be whatever, each family, somebody in these different people groups are going to be blessed through you, through this nation. How so? Because there's going to come a Messiah who is Jewish, who will die not just for Israel and their sin, but for others as well. So salvation uh, can be available for every one. And so this is what he's speaking of. And so in Acts 2, it happens. Now, I want to I want to focus on a couple things as we get to Acts 2. You're going to see some words underlined, and there's a reason for these underlined words. And so Acts 2, as we see it on the day of Pentecost, when they came together and suddenly there came a sound of heaven, a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting and it appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. So each of the people that were there now, it's important also to understand that the people that are there are the 12, are 12 disciples. Some have stated that they thought that it was 120 in the upper room. One, we don't know if it's if they're in the upper room. It just says they were in a room. So we don't know if it's an upper room. Two, it's not 120. There were 120 disciples all together in that day. But he is starting with these 12 and we see this. We know it's 12 because when we read further, we'll see Peter standing up amongst the other 11, 11 plus Peter. That's 12. So so it rests upon these these uh, disciples, these apostles now whom Jesus told. He said, you will go and this will happen. He also spoke about this to them in John 15 and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to do what? what we've seen almost every other time that someone had the spirit come upon them in the old testament they began to speak they began to prophesy they began to tell to utter to inform to give a revelation to reveal in this case what are they revealing they are testifying about the lord they began to speak with other tongues now what i want to point out to as we've been dealing with so far this word that's used here this word glossi so when we see this word glossi or glossi this is the word for where we get our word tongue. It can mean this tongue or it can mean what? Languages. We spent about the first 30 minutes or so covering that. And every time that you see in the Old Testament, be it the Hebrew word or the Greek word, it refers to either language, a known language, an understood language, or it refers to what? To the tongue in the mouth. Well, in this case, we know it's speaking about the tongue in the, I mean, the other languages, because the word that's used here, let's, put it, let's see it on the screen, is the word lalain heterice glossis. This word heterice means is other. Where we get our, our word in English, hetero, which means other. And so we see these two words. You're going to see the combination of these two words over and over again as it, as it relates to them speaking in these tongues. I think the better word that's used for is the word languages. Why? Because this word conveys the truer meaning for us to understand. So this word, lalain, glossis, we're going to keep seeing these two words used here. The word for lalain or from lalas or, la, or leo, which is to speak. We're going to see that. And then we're going to see glossis or glossa, which is languages. And so what are they speaking? Clearly they're speaking languages and they're other languages, which means these must be known languages. Well, why? Well, for a couple of reasons. Again, going back to what God is trying to accomplish to spread his gospel throughout the world, which is what he's always wanted to do to spread his glory throughout the world. But they failed at the very beginning, which is why we see them trying to get glory for themselves. And God comes down and confounds their language, spreads them out. And what do they do? Well, they don't spread the glory of God, but God is going to use that to put these different people in these different places on the earth with these different languages. God is going to reach them in these different languages to do what? to promote his glory. And so we hear them, or they are speaking these utter languages. Notice it was the spirit, though, that was giving them utterances. This was not them doing so on their own. They didn't decide to do so. Uh, the spirit came upon them, which is important. Why is that important? Because going forward, 
we need to understand that when the spirit steps in and does something, it's the spirit that causes this to happen. The spirit gave them utterance. They did not do this on their own. As a matter of fact, they didn't know this was going to happen on their own. They weren't told, at least we don't have it in scriptures, where they were told that they are going to speak languages or speak in tongues on that day. They were never told that, but it happened. And so this was not something that was forced or contrived by them. This was something that was done by the Spirit. Why is that important? Because as we go forward, if we want someone to, and, we'll, and this is a controversy that comes up, for people to speak in tongues. Well, I can't speak in tongues. The Lord has to work through me or anyone else to do so. If a person is doing it on their own, and we're going to see, we're going to read this, literally read this, but if a person is doing this on their own, then that's on their own. It's not of the Spirit. It's not of God. It's them doing so on their own. It's not that you have to have faith because remember, on this day, they had no idea. What would they, they there's no way they could have had faith in uh, the ability to speak in tongues. They didn't, they didn't accept it or reject it. It was foreign to them. And so when they spoke in tongues, it was a new phenomenon for them. They're speaking in these other languages. Now, as we go back to it, we see in verse five, there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. Uh, and when this sound occurred, the crowd came together because they were bewildered because each one of them were hearing them speak his own language. So now notice what we see. They are hearing people speak their own language, their language that they know. They hear them. Not, and it's not we can't say that they are that they're hearing a sound and then they are interpreting the sound in their own language because it's not a spiritual gift of healing. This is a spiritual gift of languages. That's what the word is. And so each one was hearing them speaking in his own language. Now, the word that's used here is this word uh, dialectos, which is dialect, dialect. We see this word even in English. But these people were speaking. So what did they hear? They heard someone else speaking their language. Okay. Uh, they were amazed and astonished saying, because again, what are we going to see? We're going to see this sign this gift, uh, this outpouring used as a way to kind of alert Israel, to alert, to alert the Jews for the good or for the bad as a sign of judgment or as a sign to convict them, to bring them in as a sign of a witness and to magnify, to testify of Christ. Because again, what did Jesus say in John 15? This will happen and they will testify or magnify Christ, magnify the Lord. What happens when we look in the, in the scriptures, if we go back to a numbers 11 or other places the spirit comes upon them and they do what they magnify the lord they speak about the lord they prophesy and so here we have because again the whole point is to prophesy and we'll, we'll we'll as we go we'll deal more with with the uh, the purposes the twofold purposes but he says that they were amazed um and astonished saying why why are not all these who are speaking galileans so again verifying that they are speaking how is it that that we each hear them in our own language. We hear them in our own language to which we were born. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighties of God. So what are they hearing them? A couple things. And I want you to sit, pay attention to what's highlighted. We hear them doing what? We hear them la luntone, which is speaking glossize. We hear them speaking in our own. Matter of fact, our own tongues or other languages. So we hear them speaking in our own languages. So again, make sure that we follow these two words, uh, la lo or la, la leo. So they're speaking languages. That's important. Every time we see this, we see them speaking languages. And so far, it's validating everything that we understood from the Old Testament up to now. So all of the books thus far that use the word for these tongues refer to an actual language. OK, that part, we need to remember that because if you're going to change the, the meaning of it, we've got to have a justification. You could not do that just yet because there is no such justification. There is no such passage. And then it tells us what they were saying, the mighty deeds of God. Well, what did Jesus say they were going to do? They were going to testify of him. 
So all these Jews who are these apostles are now speaking. <coughs> Excuse me. They're speaking the mighties of God. They are going to testify of him, what Jesus said in John 15 and what Jesus also said back in Acts 1. That's exactly what they're doing. And now other people are now also hearing them do so, but they're doing so in different languages. And they all continued in amazement and with and great perplexity saying to one another, what does this mean? What does what mean? The fact that they are speaking in these languages, glorify, magnifying God. Now, there's an issue here. Uh, everyone doesn't speak the languages that these people were hearing. What about the people who only knew the language they were born in? So if you hear Matthew, if you hear Peter, if you hear Bartholomew, if you hear them speaking in these different languages and you don't understand those languages, what does that mean for you? What does that do for you? So what ends up happening is we've got these mockers that show up. Well, what do mockers do? Well, mockers are going to mock, but others were mocking saying they are full of sweet wine. Why? Well, that's what they're supposed to do. And so I don't think that we should really give a lot of validity to the fact that these people who are mocking are mocking. These are people with not the best of intentions. That's what they're there for. But Peter, now here's where it gets important and interesting. But Peter taking his stand with the 11, so again, 11 plus Peter, the 12, which is the, the Spirit was poured out upon these apostles first, these, these 12 first, and then they give uh, this, this magnification, this witness, this testimony of Christ. What happens if you give a testimony of Christ? What What is the goal? Well, that someone will place their faith in, in, in Christ. Their hearts are going to be pricked. Well, th there's an issue here. Everyone doesn't hear this. Is, is the Lord only going to want to magnify himself before people in different languages? What about people who don't speak any of those languages? Well, they, they matter also. So now Peter gets up and he does something. But Peter, taking his stand with the 11, raised his voice uh, and declared that the men of Jerusalem, I mean of Judea, and all who live in Jerusalem, uh, let this be known to you and give heed to the words, excuse me, to the words, uh, for these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Now, by the way, the, what, what's interesting is uh, this word for spoken is where we get our word for hermeneutics. This is what has been explained. Now, the reason why this is important is because this is what has been explained through the prophet Joel. Let's explain what Joel said. The reason why this is important is because this word that I have highlighted here right now is going to show up again. Remember, this is where we get our word from for hermeneutics. This is from the word uh, ermenon, which is for the word uh, speaking or explaining. This word means to speak, to tell, to explain. Remember that. We're going to come back to this in a second. Uh, but it says, and it shall be in the last days that God says, I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind and your sons will do what now? On all mankind. Where does it come from? That comes from Genesis 12. Through you, all the nations shall be blessed. Uh, this is this is also alluded to when Moses speaks as well. And so let's go down a little bit further. And he says, continue, he says, and I will show great wonders in the sky. Let's, let's continue, continue, continue. Verse 22, he says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attest to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. So what do we see happening? We see Peter standing up, testifying of the Lord, magnifying Christ, giving a witness, a testimony to them. One of the things that Jesus said that when the spirit comes upon them, they will do. He said that in John 15. He said that in Acts 1. It's also alluded to in what Moses said that would that all of God's people prophesy. So what is he doing? And again, prophecy isn't always a foretelling, future telling prophecy. Most cases in the Bible, prophesying or giving this revelation is a forth telling, telling what is or what has happened, declaring a truth. And so if we go back to it, uh, we see him speaking about what happened with Jesus and these prophecies about him, about his death burial and resurrection. Verse 29, 
brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him an oath uh, to seat one of his descendants on his throne. So now he's relating David um, descendancy uh, being shown up in Jesus Christ. And he says that he was raised up. This Jesus in verse 32 was raised up. God raised up again to which we are now witnesses, which is what they are supposed to do. Remember, they were told to become witnesses in John 15 and in Acts 1. Now look at verse 33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. So they're seeing and hearing this. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my uh, your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you, whom you crucified. Now, notice what happens. When they heard this, what's the result? They were pierced to the heart and said to Peter, to the rest of them, what must we do to be saved? And so now, their hearts after hearing the word, after hearing Jesus being attested to, magnified, witnessed to, they now want this. Their hearts have been pricked. And so we see we have them as well as the others. Because remember, these other people have seen and heard these other people hearing the gospel or hearing Jesus being magnified by them in their other languages. And now Peter is up giving to them in their language. And so what do we have? We have people who understand the same language and people who understand different languages all hearing about Jesus and what happens. Their hearts are pricked and they are added to the church. They place their faith in Christ. Now, the issue is, though, because this isn't the only time that we see or that we hear of tongues. But what it is, it's the only time that tongues are given and we know what's said. There's no other time in the Bible where someone speaks in these languages and we know exactly what was said. There are other passages that we can look to where we hear or hear of tongues being spoken of, but we don't know what's being stated. So let's go and look at some of these other passages. And there are two other, maybe three, that you can point to where tongues are being spoken or these languages. The reason why we say maybe is because in Acts 8, we have an example of uh, the people in Samaria having this gift poured out on them. The problem is they don't, it, it doesn't tell us exactly what's happening. And so if we go down to uh, verse 14 of Acts chapter eight, this is now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John. Now it's important to see what's happening and remember what Jesus said. So going back to it, the apostles are in Jerusalem heard that Samaria, it's important, had received the word of God. They sent them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the spirit was bestowed through the laying on of hands, the apostles uh, the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give this authority to me. Now, we don't know what he saw. It's, it's hard to say what he saw, but if someone were to say, well, he saw them speaking in, saw and heard them speaking in tongues like others on the day of Pentecost, saw and heard these uh, these disciples doing the same thing, these apostles doing the same thing, then they that, that, that can be an okay conclusion to come to and probably, probably justified. It's probably likely that that's what was happening. Why is that? Well, because what did Jesus already tell them? You will be my what? Witnesses where? In Jerusalem and Judea. And then where? He gives a chronological order. Jerusalem and Judea. And then Samaria. Where are they at secondly? In Samaria. Just like the second place that he said, or the second people. Then he said to the, to the uttermost parts of the world, to the Gentiles, to the nations. What do we see happening next? We see him going to the nations, or we see them preaching to the nations. This is interesting, though, in Acts 10, what do we see? While Peter was still speaking, now he's speaking to these Gentiles. And I want you to understand something. See something that's happening. Again, to Jerusalem and Judea, one, to Samaria, and then to the nations. That's happening third. 
Here we are at the third place, the third time. Uh, the, while Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who had came, that is the Jews, with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. So now this brings up an important point. When we talked about the reason why the uh, the tongues are given, remember God is trying to do something. God is, is one, obviously magnifying himself, bringing glory to himself and letting people know about his son. Jesus is being magnified, being witnessed to, attested, attested to. And so that does a couple of things. One, obviously it brings people to him, those that place their faith in that. And then two, it is also a sign to who? To Israel, just like it was stated. We're going to look at the passage also when we get to 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to look at the passage that also uh, brings this up. Remember, God is trying to bring about um, a sense of jealousy. He's trying to make them jealous by who? By these Gentiles. And so they're going to be amazed. Even the Gentiles have it. Maybe we can understand that the Samaritans get it because the Samaritans, these are our cousins. These are those who have kind of turned their back, ironically to them think that, turned their back on the Lord and intermarried with other people, even though the Jews did the same thing. But these our I can understand the Samaritans getting it, but the Gentiles of all people, the Gentiles are getting it as well. And so the Bible says that they were amazed, all the circumcised believers, that is the Jews, who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. What are they hearing? For they were hearing them, and here's that word again, this is why it's underlined, hearing them speaking with languages. La lontone, glossize. Again, we see these two words showing up. Glossize, la lontone. We see them speaking in these languages. And they were doing what? Exalting God. What happens when a person receives the Holy Spirit? Or in this case, what's happening? What did Jesus say was happening to them when they received the Spirit? They're going to testify, magnify God. What did Jesus say in Acts 1? That very same thing. In Acts 2, what do we see? They testified and magnified God. And so when they heard this, the Jews heard them speaking in these other languages. And what were they doing? As Luke tells us, they were exalting God. Exactly what was happening then. And so when we see tongues, one of two things are happening. Either it is a sign of a witness or as a sign of to 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 the Jews, a sign, maybe a sign of judgment, a sign to cause them to uh, be amazed, maybe even provoke to jealousy in some cases, not fully with the with the, with the nation. But in, in each case, in each case, they are going to magnify Christ. They're going to magnify the Lord. They're going to do so either. As I said, one of two reasons they're going to magnify the Lord either as a witness to someone else to place their faith in Christ, or they have already done so themselves after placing their faith in Christ, magnifying the Lord, being assigned to the Jews, hopefully eventually causing the nation to be jealous. That's the whole point. So it's a sign of judgment while at the same time a witness tool, because again, you still need to have people who don't speak your language. You have to have someone to speak it in their language. Now, in this case, they're not speaking it. It doesn't seem like they're speaking a different languages. People, they already speak the same language. But then the people who receive it, they speak a different language. But this is a sign to who? To the Jews, just like what God says, what the Lord says. And we're going to find that even more so as we go further. Then we have in Acts 19, we've got those people who are um, followers of John, the disciple, who are being devoted followers. All they know is the baptism of John, but when they received the Holy Spirit, what happens? They magnify the Lord as well. It says, and when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began speaking with these tongues or speaking with languages, doing what? Prophesying. There were all in all about 12. Now let's stop there. What were they doing when they received the Spirit? This is why I want, I want us, I think it's important to kind of make the connection that when the Spirit comes upon you, you do what? You prophesy. Prophesy what? What they've always prophesied. The magnification of God. It's not always a foretelling in this case. I mean, a foretelling, a future telling. In this case, I believe this is a foretelling. They were prophesying. Why is that important? Because this is just what Moses said. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be great if these things happen? Isn't that what Joel said? Joel said the Spirit of God will come upon these people 
and they would prophesy, they would tell. They would, and that's why it's important to understand the definition of these words. To prophesy is to tell, to utter, to inform, to give a revelation. Magnification is the exact same way. And so what do we see them doing when the Spirit comes upon them? Them doing just that. Now, what's important is, if we go back to it, notice the words that are underlined. There's a reason why I have these words underlined. These words, the same word, is to the word, the Greek word for speaking and the Greek word for languages. They're used together. And so what's happening? What do we know so far? Every time we've ever heard this done or the definition is usually it's only been either their tongue, the member in their mouth or languages. So these speaking languages have always been the words that's used. Matter of fact, sometimes we might even get it um, an extra explanation by other languages put in there, such as we see in Acts 2 and in other places. We'll come to that in just a little bit, but I just want just to be mindful of the Greek words that are used, the words that are used to describe what we're seeing. The words that are used to describe what we're seeing are uh, laleo and glosas, or glos glosa. Here we see that here. We saw it in Acts 2. We saw it in uh, Acts 10. And we're going to see it a couple other places. Now, the first time that we see this is in the gospel. Now, some might might balk at this, whether this was added later, uh, whether this was an original writing of the scriptures, whether it, now we don't see it in the earliest best attested to manuscripts, but that's fine. I won't, I won't argue that point here. What I will point to, what I will show is, is that these signs, these signs will accompany those who have believed. Now, the question is, is the person that wrote this, is this speaking of the apostles only, or is he speaking of all of mankind? I think here in this point, uh, even though I'm one also like the uh, the vast majority of textual critics, that this was uh, added as a note and not part of the original manuscripts. But even still, I think the point that, that the writer is pointing to is he's speaking to the, the apostles. Why? Because it says, in my name they will cast out demons, which we see the apostles do. Now, others, non-apostles may have done so also, but they will speak with new languages uh, they will pick up serpents. We only see that with with really one apostle. Uh, they, if they drink any deadly poison, same thing will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick. We see that with the apostles uh, and they will recover. So we have these things that are descriptive of the apostles. But I want to point to this. I don't want to belabor that point. But what I do want to look at is this word here. Speak with new tongues. Now, the word for new is kinais, which is new. Uh, but here we have glosis lale susin which is speaking in languages. So what will they do? The same words that are used here is speaking in languages. And we know these are understood because it says new, not a singular new tongue, but plural tongues, languages. If you were to refer to, let's say, some sort of ecstatic language, or some might think it's a heavenly language, well, you would use, you would only use the plural. Now, we'll deal with this issue of heavenly languages in a second, in just a little bit. I shouldn't say a second, but just a little bit. But here he's speaking of different languages. Well, what happens? They end up speaking different languages. So going back to uh, the passages in, in, the, uh, in Acts, we see them speaking languages, people understanding them to be languages, and in so they are marveling. Now, I want you to think about it. If they weren't languages, it'd be kind of hard for someone if they're speaking something that is not a language, if they're speaking some sort of ecstatic uh, language, some sort of ecstatic speech, something that somebody might might liken to as babbling or gibberish. No one is in awe of that. No one will ever be in awe of someone babbling or, or speaking gibberish, what they think is gibberish. If you think something is gibberish or babbling, you're not in awe of it. You're not uh, in wonderment. You're not amazed like we see in Acts 10, like we see in Acts 2, like we see in Acts 8. We're not amazed by that. Some Anyone today could do that. And matter of fact, anybody could do that. Any child could do so. Someone who, who has some sort of issue, mental issue, could do that. And no one is amazed. But if you speak another language, then people will stand up and take notice. How is this happening? As they say, aren't these just mere Galileans. These are Galileans. And so again, the reason for that is we have people who are um, speaking these languages and they understood and they, for whatever reason, 
Uh, I'm sorry, not for whatever reason, but, but they are uh, amazed by that. Now, there's a couple of passages I want to I want to go to. Romans eight for one. This passage is brought up. And I think it needs to be understood that this should not be brought up or used as an example uh, for tongues. As a matter of fact, you should not use. As a matter of fact, this passage goes against tongues. In Acts, I'm sorry, Acts, Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Or some versions might say for words that cannot be uttered. Well, just the English should be should be sufficient to understand that this is not speaking about tongues or language. Matter of fact, this is not verbal. This is not coming out of your mouth. How do we know? Because it says too deep for words. The word that's used here is the word stenokmois, which is for an inward sigh. It doesn't come out. You don't hear it. Uh, or for words that cannot be uttered in some versions. So these are not words that are uttered. This is not the spirit speaking through you to um, speak in tongues. OK, so I think that part needs to be understood. It's not that that um, difficult uh, of something to kind of grasp. This is clearly not not tongues here. Now, where we get into our issue is going to come about in obviously in first Corinthians. But before we do, let's think about this in first Corinthians. Uh, we, there might be there tends to be a shift for people in the understanding of the words. So before we do that, I want to go back and cover a couple things. One remembering what does the word mean when we look at this word as we did earlier when we go back and we see the word used throughout the old testament all we ever saw was it meaning one of two things the only usages of this word be it the hebrew or the greek has been to convey to us the tongue the actual pink member in our mouth and then actual languages that's all we have so if there are, and there will be people that will say, well, there is another meaning for this, such as an angelic, angelic language or a heavenly language or an unknown language for us, but known to God. The problem is, thus far, we don't have that understanding. As a matter of fact, what we really do have is previous um, to 1 Corinthians, uh, what, what, what languages or what tongues mean. And then what we also have is after 1 Corinthians, what the word languages mean. Now, for some people, this might, might come as a surprise, but it's important to understand that the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, 13, 14, they were written after Acts. So, so the description of tongues in Acts comes after Paul's writing of tongues in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. So, I think that also helps in the understanding of really what tongues are. Again, what are tongues? Tongues are, um, so far as we can tell, tongues are an actual language. Tongues are a language or the member of our mouth. And then we're starting to see the purpose of it. The purpose of tongues is to magnify or to show as a witness. And what's the point, purpose of that witness, the, magnif the magnification? Twofold. One, that people can hear the gospel if they need, if need be, they hear it in a different language the language that they hear it in, or two, as a sign to Israel. And oftentimes, for the most part, it's been a sign of judgment and to make them jealous. They are eventually going to come around eventually, but at this point, by and large, it has not happened. And so we see this as a unifier, these, these tongues being to unify those to Christ, those for the first time or, or even those who are of Jewish descent. Now, why is that important? Well, we need to understand that this is the spirit coming upon someone, moving them. So before we go further into tongues, I want to look at something else and I want to see really what the purpose of these, of the moving of the spirit is. Now, when we talk about spiritual gifts, we won't go too far in it, but the gift of the spirit is the spirit. It's not that the Lord gives us maybe one gift of that gift, would, however he sees fits to move on us as he did with the apostles or disciples, however he sees fit, however he sees fit, then that will be it. If it happens to show up in languages, amen. If it happens to show up in healing, amen. If it happens to show up in us being quiet and having wisdom, amen, or learning, amen. But the point and purpose of this 
has always been for the benefit of others. Interestingly enough, we never see not one example, not one example in the Bible of a spiritual gifting, a spiritual gift being used for that person's self. Paul had the ability to heal, but he couldn't heal himself. Same thing with Peter or anyone else. Matter of fact, they could not heal um, people that they wanted to heal, such as Timothy or Trophimus. So uh, the point of these giftings, though, are for the benefit of others. Remember, when Jesus tells them in John 15, he says that you will be my witness. You will testify to other people. OK, uh, and then we go to, let's say, first Peter four. Let's go there. First Peter four. Uh, tells us verse 10, he says, uh, as each one has received a special gift or gifting, employ it how? In serving others as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So the point is, whatever, however the Spirit has gifted you, whatever the, however the Spirit is working in you, how does Peter say, Peter who's an apostle, full of the Spirit, moved by the Spirit, says that we should employ it in serving one another as good stewards of God's manifold grace. Uh, then, matter of fact, whoever, speak, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things, what do we see? God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever. So here we have even more of, of this kind of um, kind of bringing together the whole purpose. This is God in you, his spirit in you, and to serve. Look what he says. Let's go back to that passage again. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength, or we say the spirit, the strength, the spirit of God, who supplies it so that in all things God may be glorified. Whoever is speaking um, is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of of God. Now, what do we say? Remember, we talked about this. What does a prophet do when you prophesy? You are uttering, you are telling, you are informing, you are revealing. Revealing what? Revealing of God. So whoever speaking is to do so as one who is speaking the utterance of God. And so we are speaking of God, by God, about God, through God, through his power, through his spirit, and serving in that same fashion. And so that's why he says to serve one another. If we go to Romans, let's go to Romans 12 first. Romans 12 he speaks about, as a matter of fact, let's pull up a little further, where he speaks about, though the grace given to me, I speak to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to, because what is our issue? We can easily think more about ourselves, especially if we have some sort of gifting. That would really go to our head. If you have some particular gift and someone pats you on the back, if they think that gift was employed, uh, it, can, it can make you feel good or better about yourself, almost giving you what, what Simon was looking for in Acts 8. He says, for just as we have many members and one body and all members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of another. Since we have different gifts or gifts are different according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Well, should we exercise them for ourselves? Well, no. All of these gifts, as we look, as we read these, we won't for now for sake of time, but all of these are going outward. All of these are not inward focus, but outward focus. Verse nine, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to, look what he says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. So he is emphasizing what our gifting should be outwardly, giving preference and love to one another, not to yourself. Then he says in verse four, chapter 14, verse 19 of Romans, so then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. So that's what we that's what we pursue. That's what we're after. We're after other people growing in the Lord. We're after other people, um, their faith being in the Lord, being built up by our own gifting. That's the point. Now, when we get to 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to find out uh, the whole point, the purpose of all of this. And this is where... I think it's vitally important, one, to remember what we've been taught. So so thus far, we've been taught, we've been seeing from the Old Testament to the New, whether it be the Hebrew word or the Greek word, what the word tongue is, how it's used. Uh, we see the point, the purpose. We see what God is after. God is after taking two and making them one. And he does so by him being witness to. So the spirit comes upon us. He testify. We testify of him. We give a revelation. We give an utterance. We declare. We inform. We reveal, we prophesy about the Lord. 
And in doing so, someone comes to Christ, someone places their faith in Christ, or and or probably both, maybe both, someone of Israel, Israeli descent, is bothered. They are made jealous. It is a sign, and this sign is an affront to them because it is showing what God is doing, not just for them, but for also the world. And so God is using them, as he says, using the Gentile, using the nations to make Israel jealous. And this will be a sign. And we're going to come back to that in just a little bit because we're going to see something that Paul brings up later, referring back to this very same thing. Uh, matter of fact, we're going to see the, the prophecy in Isaiah where God is saying that eventually Israel is going to have their minds changed. And they are not all of Israel but he's going to have a specific focus towards Israel and they are going to confess Jesus as their Messiah. Uh, in the end, they're going to look back and say that this is he who was bruised for our transgression, which is why he's using these past tense verbs. And so going to, so we, I'm sorry. And so we see the point, the purpose of this is to make Israel, it to be a sign to Israel as God is making them jealous by the Gentiles and also as a sign of, as a means of witnessing, testifying. When you testify of Christ, what's going to happen? People are going to place their faith in Christ. Some are going to think that it's foolishness. The Jews are going to be upset. It's going to be, he's going to be a stumbling stone to them. But this is the point. So it's a twofold purpose found in the, the uplifting, the magnification, the witness, the testimony of Christ. So now when we get to chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, now we have Paul chiming in on these spiritual gifts. And so he says, now concerning spiritual gifts. Now, the word that's used here is the word pneumatikon, pneumatikon, which means the things of the spirit or the spiritual things or the spiritual. Now concerning the spiritual. Now, if you want to use the word gifts, that's fine. Uh, brethren, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant or unaware. The word ignorant is from the word agnoain. The word noe is from the word mind or to know. And then we have ah, which is to not know. I don't want you to not know or to be ignorant or to be unaware. Remember that also. Because that point is going to come up in just a little bit. He says, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is a curse, which makes sense. Who in their right mind under the Spirit of God would ever say Jesus is a curse? But apparently this is happening because he says, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. We know that people say that Jesus is Lord by the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is saying that there are people speaking because those are the words that he says. No one speaking, not thinking, but speaking would ever say by the Spirit of God that Jesus is accursed or that uh, just similarly by that same Spirit, you would have to say that the only way that you can say that Jesus is Lord is by the Spirit. So he says that there's someone, there's something that's happening um, unknowingly, ignorantly. You folks are unaware. You're saying some things that you should not be saying. That seems to be what Paul is saying here. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. This is back to what Paul was saying in Romans 12. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So look what Paul just said. Each one, all of us, we are each is given the manifestation, the revealing, the, the spirit working in us. Why? He tells us exactly why. For the common good, which is why Paul tells us he kind of likens us or we're likened to a body and each person is an individual member, but each member of the body is to affect the rest of the body. Again, the hand is not to benefit the hand solely. The hand uh, is to help the other hand. If your foot is hurt, what comes to the aid? The hand and vice versa. The foot is not for the benefit of the foot. It's for the benefit of the body. That's Paul's entire point here. So he says the spirit is given for the common good, not for you, not for yourself, but for the common good. And so thus far, we see, as a matter of fact, every other time that we look through the scriptures, we see the spirit being employed, as Peter says, as others said, for the common good, for the benefit of others. We have never yet seen an example of the spirit being used in somebody for themselves. That's important. So for to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit and another the word of knowledge according to the same spirit 
to another faith by the same spirit and to another gifts of healing by one spirit and to another the effecting of miracles and to another prophecy and to another the distinguishing of, of gifts, oh, I'm sorry, of, of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues. And so this word that's used here is hetero, genai, glossa, glosong, which is different tongues. Uh, to, now we know he's speaking of different tongues because he's going to re relate this, this the exact same way that we've always seen it in terms of speaking tongues, those two Greek words we're looking for, and to another interpretation of tongues. Now, I said earlier, that word that was used when when Paul when Peter is up speaking in Acts 2, this word where we get the word for uh, hermeneutics, hermeneo, is also used here for this interpretation, this translation, this explanation. So the word for interpretation, the literal word, mean, the word literally means to interpret, to explain, to give an understanding, to explain something. Okay, to translate something. Well, it's not necessarily a verbatim translation or explanation, but it's just making sure that you understood what was said. The issue is, who gives the explanation? Can the person who is speaking these tongues also be the person that gives an explanation? Uh, well, we're going to find out that Paul wants all of us to have an explanation if you are that very same person that's speaking. So it should not be just some outside person that understands what was said, but the person that is speaking also has to understand we're going to see that in a little bit let's go back to it but the but one of the same spirit works all these things distributing uh all these things distributing to each one individually just as he wills so now let's park here for just a moment if we're going to say that we want people to if you are the kind of person that says that you want people to speak in tongues it's not up to you nor the person that you might want to speak in tongues it's up to the spirit because he is the one that distributes in, that, that distributes individually just as he wills. Like on the day of Pentecost, it was him on that day that gave utterance. They didn't decide to do so on their own. It was the spirit that moved in them. So in other words, if the spirit moves in a person and the spirit wants a person to speak in languages, and I'm using the word languages, if you want to use tongues, that's fine. But if the spirit wants them to do so, then they will what? They will do so. It's not really up to, for negotiation. We don't see anyone ever stopping it. Uh, we don't see someone, the spirit comes upon someone and someone stopping that. No, when the spirit moves, the spirit moves and all you do is you acquiesce. That is, if you are a believer. So he says, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Now look how he puts this. For even as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. That's the whole point. We are one one not individual so that's why the giftings the spirit the spiritual gifts that a person may have is for the body uh for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body whether jew or greek whether slave or free and we were all made to drink of one spirit for the body is not one member but many if the foot says because i am not a hand i am not a part of the body uh it is not a, for this reason any the less a part of the body and if the ear says because i'm not an eye i am not a part of the body so his point is if your gifting doesn't seem to be on par with someone else's gift you are still a part of the body as a matter of fact you are no less part of the body oftentimes what we do is we um, give credit more credit to the person with certain gifts than someone with another gift and it's usually the gifts that seem to for some people, make people feel as though that person has more spirituality, a greater connection. If you prophesy whether the prophecy comes true or not, doesn't have to. People tend to want to give you some sort of credit, pat you on the back and say, wow, that was a powerful move of God. And we don't know if, the, if, if this was a false prophet or not, at least at that point in time. Uh, that is unless what they say counters goes against the scriptures. If someone were to speak in tongues, nowadays, if you speak in tongues, and no, even if there's no interpreter, even if it sounds like, some ecstatic language, some some babble or what have you. People are still going to say, wow, that was a powerful move of God. And so we tend to ascribe more to certain gifts than do others. But what does Paul say? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole uh, were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as, look, here it is, as he desired. So whatever your gifting is, it's how God desired it. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Uh, or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. We all need every part of the body. On the contrary, 
it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable. So the things that we don't think much about, those are vitally important. You think about certain parts of your body that you might think is small or insignificant, or you don't give a lot of attention to, let something happen. When was the last time you gave a lot of thought to your spleen or your liver or your kidneys? Those are small parts of our body, but vitally important. Uh, if certain brain cells, if something happens with a brain cell, that small, but a vital part of the body. And so that's Paul's point. We don't think of it or deem it with a lot of honor, but they are, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so com composed the body giving more abundant honor to that member which lack. In other words, God is the one that notices you more so than anyone else. So therefore, he says, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same, look what he says, the same care for one another. Again, each part of the body is to care for other parts of the body, not to care for itself. And so we're starting to see, we should see, hopefully if we haven't done so already, so what we should see, if we haven't done so already, that each part of the body is meant for the care of the other. There is no such thing as the hand being only out for the hand's own personal goals or needs, whatever. The head needs the feet. The feet needs the arms. The legs need the fingers and so forth. And so each part needs the other part. And if one member suffers, all the members suffers, verse 28, with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are Christ's bodies and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church, look what he says, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. Now look what Paul says, are not all apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? Are they all not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? Now, the, the word of the shoes there, speaking with tongues, all do not speak with tongues. The word of the shoes there again, glossize, lalosin. So we understand what it said earlier about various kinds of tongues. Uh, we knew that he was speaking of speaking in languages. Why? Because it's used here, glossize, lalosin. Those two words, to speak and then languages are both used here. All do not interpret, do they, but earnestly desire the greater gifts. Now, before we move forward, we know the obvious answer to all of these is no. Why? Because in the Greek, it tells us no. Why do I say that? Because look what it says. May, which is the word for no or not, not all, may pontes glucis lalusin, which is not all speak in tongues. So he's declaring that not everyone. So even though our English version may refer, I mean, form it as a form of a question, the answer is already implied and supplied with the no, not all. No, we all do not speak in these languages. So we could not come back and say that everyone speaks in languages. The problem comes in is when we change, give a different definition of what the word means, and then we throw chaos and confusion. Because if the word doesn't mean what it's always meant, but now it is subject to what I think it means, there's just no way we can communicate. Now the words have different meaning, and this meaning is not supplied by the scripture. So if we're going to say here that this speaking in tongues means something different, or there are different types of speaking in tongues, what well, you're going to have to give an example, because thus far, at this point, we don't have one example of it meaning anything but your tongue or speaking languages. And when you supply the laleo, or the lalosin in this case, with the with the glow size, it only means speaking languages. That's all it could. That's all it's ever meant. If it means something different, we're going to have to have some passage, someone telling us where it means something different. Now we're going to go to the passages where people uh, try to do so, but we are going to have to still find an example, a rationale, a justification for doing so. But before we go forward, he says, "All do not interpret." Right. Well, this word is used here. We see this word again. If you look at the bottom, it's word made up of two words, di and ermineu, which is, what's this ermineu, which is to explain. So this di ermineu, which we saw earlier, is the word for explanation or to interpret. This is the word that's used that we saw Peter use this word. It was used earlier um, in the chapter as well. This is to explain. So all people don't explain or don't interpret or translate, do they? 
but I want to focus on this particular word. We're going to look at this word a little bit later because the question is going to be if languages, if tongues are a known language, well, then why do there, does there need to be an interpreter? Well, think about it now. If I began speaking in, I don't know, Mandarin, and you don't speak Mandarin, then, then someone needs to interpret. There needs to be explanation. If I began supernaturally speaking in Mandarin, and I've never spoken in Mandarin, I need to have an understanding of what this is. And so that's one of the Paul, one of uh, Paul's points here. We'll get to that more in just a second. He says, I will show you a more excellent way uh, that is to desire the greater gifts or to desire the greater uh, giftings. So now verse 13, chapter 13, verse one, this is important because he will, before he goes into more of this um, understanding of, remember Paul is writing this letter to the church of Corinth because there is uh, a misuse of, of gifts in this particular chapter, this, this area, but he's really writing because there is disunity. There is division. We see that in first, in the first part of the book, uh, the earlier parts of the book, he says, I don't want there to be any divisions among you. Then he speaks in terms of the, the body, the church, but he also does so in terms of the family when we get to chapter seven, but then we get to 12, he says now concerning spiritual gifts. And so what concerning spiritual gifts? Now concerning spiritual gifts as it relates to unity, no divisions, which is why he goes through this whole issue about us being part of the same body. And so the only way that you can understand that is if you have what is the second greatest gift, I mean, commandment, that you love others. And so Paul reiterates this. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. Now, let's pause there with the whole issue of love. Let's just pause because what was just introduced for some people they think is a rationale to now change the definition of the word tongues, what tongues can be. Now we have, for some people, we have the introduction of another way that tongues are. So now tongues are a different language, but they are not just a language, German, French, Swahili, Mandarin, English, uh, Egyptian, Hebrew, Greek, no. Now we have introduced a heavenly language or an angelic language. The problem is there is no justification. One, it seems as though Paul is speaking hyperbolic. Let's deal with that part first. If I, if I speak in the tongues or the languages of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy uh, gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, well, a couple things. Does Paul have to get the prophecy? Sure. But does Paul know all mysteries? No, absolutely he does not. Or have all knowledge? No, he does not. And if he, if I have all faith, does Paul have all faith so as to remove mountains? No, he does not. He's speaking if these things were true or possible, hyperbolically speaking, but do not have love, I'm nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, did Paul do so? No, he did not. And if I surrender my body to be burned, he did not. Now, is Paul willing to, to, to surrender his body to be burned? I'm sure he is, but he did not. He's speaking hyperbolically. But do not have love, it profits me nothing. That's like me saying, if I could go to the moon and back, if I can save the world from cancer, if I can give everybody a million dollars in their account, there'd be no, if I can end world hunger and poverty, but don't have love, it's nothing. That's his point. I don't have those abilities. I can't do those things. But his point is, this needs to be in love. And so Paul is speaking hyperbolic. Let's go back to this tongues of, of angels here. Speaking about these tongues of angels, here's the question. Has there ever been an occasion anywhere in the scriptures for angels speaking? Is there a such thing as tongues of angels, languages of angels? In other words, Corey, the question might be, do angels, what languages do angels speak? when they communicate to each other. Well, we don't know if they do or don't. We don't know how they speak. The Bible doesn't tell us. All we have to go off of is when angels speak to humans and when humans speak back to angels. Well, do we have occasions to read where angels have spoken with humans and humans have spoken back with angels? We sure do. What do we notice? Well, one, every time that an angel has spoken to a human being, it seems to be that that human being heard the angels speaking in their own language. In other words, 
the human being that's hearing from the angel did not need someone to interpret or to explain what was stated. As a matter of fact, when the human being speaks with the angel, how does the human being speak to the angel? Speak to the angel in their own language. So, for example, if Moses is speaking Hebrew and an angel speaks to him or Abraham or Hagar or whomever else, if anyone hears or sees an angel, if Lot speaks to an angel and he speaks Hebrew, let's just assume that he's speaking Hebrew. If the angels are speaking to Lot, the angels spoke to him in the language that he understood, which presumably is Hebrew. Vice versa, when, when Lot spoke to the angels, how did he speak to them? In his language. There was no interpreter there. Uh, there was no need for someone to bring about extra explanation. There was never the occasion that was spoken. What do you mean by this? I don't understand. Apparently, how the angel spoke was in the language, in the understanding of the human being. Remember, they are ministering spirits. And so for them to come in a way that's confusing, that wouldn't make any sense. So can an angel speak different languages? I'm sure they do. I'm sure when they speak to someone, if they were to speak to, some, to someone who spoke Greek or who spoke Aramaic or Hebrew or what have you, I'm pretty sure they would speak to them in their language. I get that. The issue is, are they speaking in known languages? Apparently, it seems to be that in the Bible, angels are speaking known language. Further, when we look up, remember when we were over in Lagos and we were looking up this word here, we were looking up uh, the times that, if I can pull up on the screen, let me slide this a little bit further. When we pulled up on the screen, every time that the tongue was used, every time, and we see this word glossi, we never in the Bible see that word, that phrase being used of the angels speaking in these various languages. We just know the angel is speaking. The angel said, the angel spoke. That's it. So even this gifting or this glow sign is never ascribed. The speaking in tongues is never ascribed to an angel. We're just told that the angel spoke to the person, the person spoke back. That was it. So whether it's a, 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 a different angelic language, we just simply do not have that. So whether it be in Genesis, whether it be in Daniel, whether it be in Exodus, the angels are speaking in the known languages of the person that they are speaking to. Same thing with the people back. And the words that's used to describe them are not the same words of some sort of ecstatic language, some sort of angelic language. We just never see that. And so we never have a justification to come back and say that there is a such thing as a heavenly language that we can speak. Because Paul makes this statement, if, if I say that Paul is being hyperbolic, or that there's, or if you come back and say that there is a different type of language, a heavenly language, give an example. Do we have one example of an angel in the Bible speaking a language other than the language that the people that are listening can understand? As a matter of fact, even the non-believers, even, even in the Old Testament, when the angel spoke to a person who was not a believer, same thing, they understood. So, we don't have any justification whatsoever to come back and say that. And the problem is when you change the rules in the middle of the, the game, it makes it hard. It makes it difficult for us to play together. We just cannot. And you and no one can then be upset because, hey, I don't understand why you're doing that if you don't give me a reason. Because you see the tongues of angels will question, again, what then is or are tongues of angels? All you can say is, I don't know. Do you have an example of tongues of angels in the Bible? No. Have you ever heard tongues of angels? Well, I think I have. Where? Well, when I hear someone speaking what sounds like babble, that might be tongues of angels. Well, how do you know those are tongues of angels? Do you have any basis to believe that what you heard are tongues of angels? Oh, by the way, when you hear someone who speaks this babble or what someone may call gibberish, Maybe not to be insulting, but or this ecstatic language. When you hear someone, how do you know this is truly them being led by the Spirit? Can someone manufacture this? Can someone make it up? Can someone offer fake tongues? Well, obviously the answer is yes. Here's how I know. One, I spoke in tongues uh, some 30 years ago. I used to do that. And people will say, well, those weren't genuine tongues. That's fine. 
I'll say the same thing. But here's what I do know. My tongues sounded like their tongues. Their tongues sounded like my tongues. And everyone agreed. No one said, hey, those are fake tongues. As a matter of fact, when was the last time you heard someone say, hey, your tongues aren't legitimate? Your tongues aren't real because their tongue sounds like everyone else's tongue. There's no one that's holding. It seems to be, unfortunately, no one in a certain community in the Christian body that is holding their brothers accountable when they think uh, that there are counterfeit tongues. There's a matter of fact, the idea of that is not even there. So if there is the possibility of fake tongues, if the possibility exists that people can speak in fake tongues, What's the difference? How do you know? How do you know that these fake tongues that sound like legitimate tongues and you said the legitimate tongues are angelic languages Well, then that person that's faking them can also fake angelic tongues. So that means that anyone can counterfeit or manufacture fake angelic tongues. Is that possible? Does that even make sense? That seems to defy the law the, that just to defy spiritual logic to think that someone can manufacture or fake angelic tongues. And if you can fake angelic tongues, then what is the purpose of these so-called angelic tongues? Again, what do angelic heavenly tongues or heavenly languages sound like? Do we have an example when God speaks to us in the Bible and when people in the Bible speak, speak to him, they seem to speak in the language that they know and understand and God does so as well. He speaks to them in that language. And so we still have no basis whatsoever, no biblical basis. That is, if we want to be accountable to the scriptures and we want to do what 1 Corinthians 4, 6 says, Paul says not to do, not to exceed from the text or to exceed what is written. If we say that that 1 Corinthians 13 is introducing angelic languages or angelic tongues or heavenly tongues or heavenly languages, what we're doing then is we are exceeding what is written now. Let's continue because I want to also cover this point as well. Verse four, love is patience. So the whole point of 1 Corinthians 13 is about love. Love is patience. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not promote itself, uh, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Remember, if if you are seeking your own to edify or build yourself up, that, that, isn't that kind of going counter to what we see here? There's a reason why I'm bringing that up. Love is not provoked. Love does not take into account wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, verse eight, this is important. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues or languages, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. Now, I differ from a lot of people that I um, that I think have good doctrine in that I don't believe that these gifts have, the Bible has told us that these gifts have ceased. So we're talking about tongues. Do I think that tongues or languages have ceased? No. But notice what all three of these are saying. Now, first of all, all three of these are connected. So we cannot say that tongues or languages um, have ceased uh, and then prophecy has been done away with, but knowledge is still there. They're all connected. So it'd be difficult to say that two of the three are gone, but the one that we like is still here. That would be kind of difficult to say. So, And it's okay to say that all three are here because we have a standard whereby we can measure and determine if what we're seeing or hearing is the truth. But notice what all three of these things have in common. Notice the point, the purpose, the use of these, th of these three. Prophecy, languages, knowledge. What could those possibly have in common? What's the point? What's the purpose? Well, if the Spirit is going to come upon someone and the person is going to give a revelation to tell the utterance of someone, there it is. I think all three of these things work together, especially when it comes to magnifying, giving a testimony, giving a witness to the Lord. That is to foretell, or in, in some cases, if it's a foretell, to give the future, but it is to do so in regard to the kingdom. If there are tongues, languages, what are the point of languages? It's to prophesy, to bring about uh, an understanding to witness to testify of Christ. What does that do for the benefit of the kingdom? Same thing for knowledge. What is the knowledge for? Is it to know how to perform open heart surgery? Is it is it so that we can know how to change a transmission on a car? No, it is to bring about understanding of the what? The kingdom. All three of these things 
are together. They're used together, not necessarily simultaneously, but they all have to do with what? Testifying of Christ. Healing someone may, may in and of itself doesn't testify of Christ. Okay? Raising someone from the dead in and of itself does not testify of Christ. Having mercy or love or giving money to the poor in and of itself doesn't testify of Christ. But these three do. These three things are the things that when we look at, they tell us about Christ. When you give a, a revelation of God, you are given a revelation of God, of the Lord. If you are bringing about these tongues, every time that we've seen it, they were doing what? Testifying of the Lord, which is what Paul brought up in 1 Corinthians 12, the opening that by the Spirit you say that Jesus is Lord, not that he's accursed. And then this other part where it says that there is knowledge, knowledge of what? Of the Lord to share with other people. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the part will be done away with. So in Christ, I believe the perfect is Christ's return. When he comes, the perfect, all of those things that we that we have in part will be done away with. Now, let's drop down. Let's go to the most important part or the not the most important part, but the part that people want to get into. That's chapter 14. And he says, he says before though, though he says, but now faith, hope, and love abide. Um, but the greatest of these things is love. The greatest of these things are love. And that's his whole point. I think sometimes we read chapter 13 and we forget the point, the purpose of chapter 13. So now before we go into chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, let's remember, let's recap. Let's keep in mind everything that we've covered, what tongues are, what the word is. So far, the words have been consistent. We don't see any different uses of the word for the word glossa. We don't see anyone using it any differently. But we're going to have, for some people, going to introduce another meaning for this phrase uh, where we use these two Greek words, baleo and glossa, which is speaking in tongues or speaking in languages. We're going to see someone that want to maybe try to add some sort of nuances, such as there's a difference between what's spoken up, uh, spoken about by Paul uh, or what happened in Acts 2 versus what we're seeing today, which brings us to this issue is our tongues to be used differently, meaning uh, there are those that introduce this new idea that there is speaking in tongues and then there's this praying in tongues. <clears throat> there's the gift of tongues. And there's praying tongue. There's a there's a difference, but the problem is we don't see that. As a matter of fact, what we do see are these same two words that are used: the word for speaking, and the word for tongues or languages. So let's go into First Corinthians 14, remembering what we saw so far, and then as we apply that to First Corinthians 14, some things I think should stick out. This is where you have to go ahead and divorce your biases or your preconceived notions or your preferences. It is something that I had to do because, again, <clears throat> I started off believing uh, in tongues the way that the average, the majority of charismatics or Pentecostals would believe it. That's the way that I, that I was brought to believe. It. That's the way that I started off believing, and I had to fight others who disagreed with that, and eventually, at some point in time, I've got to let the text say what it says. And so when we start up in 1 Corinthians 14, there's something that we don't see people bring up an awful lot. And that is what's, what it actually says here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want to bring this up and I want to offer uh, a little bit more insight in what the words are saying. Sometimes what we see in English uh, is clear enough, but sometimes there can be some confusion in English. And so when we have some sort of confusion as to what something means, we then have to turn to what the Greek means or what the Hebrew says. And so the language gives, or the, the original language, in this case, the Greek, uh, offers some priority in our in our interpretation over the English. And so where the English, where there might be some debate, there really is no debate with the Greek. And so when someone was going to say, well, I challenge how you see verses one and two and so forth. Well, then the issue is I would ask that someone would challenge how we see it in the Greek. The reason why I say that is because as we look at the Greek um, compared to the English, I think uh, the, the Greek obviously has to interpret the English. When we look at it, it says, Dokate tain agapain, zalute, um, I'm sorry, <clears throat> zalute, uh, de ta numatika. And this is where numatika, and this is uh, the spiritual things. And so it says, desire, I'm sorry, pursue the love or pursue love. Okay. So that part is clear. But then it's where we get to this next part, day, which is yet and or but 
or now, but in this case, yet desire, now desire, but desire the spiritual. Now, we've already covered what the spiritual is. The pneumaticon is not necessarily the spiritual gifts. It is the things of the spirit, the spiritual. And so he says, pursue love, yet or but earnestly desire the spiritual things or the things of the spirit. Now, here's this phrase right here that it's going to be a little bit difficult for someone to get around this particular phrase, malone. And if you look at the bottom of the words I'm highlighting, you'll also see the explanation or the the uh, the definition of the word malone, which is more or rather. Uh, you can also go with especially, but the problem is especially it might be a little bit too ambiguous, not a not a clear enough understanding because we have this day, which is a post positive. So, but um, malone rather, but rather in order that you prophesy. When you see this word here, henna, this word henna is in order that, so that, that. This is the reason why you do these things. So whenever you see this word henna, anywhere in the scriptures, you are going to have to start think, thinking that this is the reason why it's a purpose clause. It introduces a purpose clause in order that you prophesy. Well, we've already talked about what it means to prophesy. That is just simply just to bring revelation, to inform, to tell, to utter, to declare, to bring revelation. So in order that you would tell, in order that you would bring a revelation, in order that you would inform, in order that you would tell, what are you doing in order to tell? Well, uh, desire the spiritual things in order to do this, which is why we have it underlined. And so, but especially that you may prophesy or in order that you may prophesy. So what are we doing? We are pursuing love. Um, yet, or also to go along with that desire earnestly the things of the spirit, the spiritual things. Why do we want to desire these spiritual things? In order that we would prophesy. Now, we've talked about it before that when we say prophesy, prophesy doesn't mean that you would be a prophet or necessarily even the gift of prophecy. But even if you want to take it that way, the Bible is clear. It's the spirit of the Lord that will come upon us, not in every case, in every instance, but in order to prophesy. We saw that again in Numbers. We saw it in Exodus. We saw it other places in the Old Testament. And we see that also in Acts. We see this being stated that the reason for the purpose of these things is so that we would give a prophecy, not a foretelling prophecy, not in terms of telling what is going to happen in the future, but in terms of giving a word or giving a revelation, uttering something, telling, informing something. That's the whole point. We want to let people know about the Lord. We want to magnify. We want to testify. We want to give witness to him. And so that's why you desire the spiritual things in order that, as Paul says in Romans, that you would be speaking as those God speaking through you, that you would then give a declaration to testify of Christ. That's why it says in order that you would prophesy. This part needs to be addressed before we go forward. The whole point in all the spiritual gifts or the spiritual things uh, to be to be correct, the pneumaticon is in order that we would prophesy. And who brings about that? Who causes us to give a revelation? Well, it's the spirit. The spirit comes upon you. What do you do? You tell about the goodness of the Lord. <clears throat> Going for, forward in verse four, for the one speaking in a tongue. Now, here is where some of the controversy can come in. Verse two, for no, for, for the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands, but he, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, a couple of things, there's a lot to unpack even in this particular verse. Number one, where we see it says his spirit, the word his is not there. Even if someone wants to offer or add in, in some versions, he speaks mystery in the spirit. The word, the definite article, the is not there. And this is where it, it, it can be difficult. Some scholars would put the word the there. That's why this is italicized. Some would put his. It's kind of hard, difficult to, to ascertain. And so what ends up happening is oftentimes uh, all of these words that we see are done by committee vote, meaning that in the translation committee, and I don't care which committee it is, if it's the, the King James, New King James, the ESV, the NASV, if it's the RSV, if it's the Net Bible, if it is the NIV, there are people in that room that are determining or not necessarily in the room, but that are voting on 
what's the best word to use here? How do we see this word? And so depending upon which translation you see, you're going to find out who, who's, uh, <laughs> whose words won. Whereas someone might want to put in the spirit, some may want to put in his spirit. And so clearly in this translation committee, the NASB, uh, the word that's used here is they believe that it's in his spirit. Why is that important? Well, if it really is in his spirit, well, then this is speaking about a person who is doing it incorrectly. Who Now, remember, Paul is writing this letter, and I think that also needs to be stated as well. Paul is writing this letter to the Church of Corinth not to say, you guys are doing a wonderful job. You guys, this is how you ought to do it. No, Paul is writing uh, to admonish them. This is a letter of rebuke to say what you all are doing wrong. So they're doing something wrong, and in this case, this seems to regard something having to do with speaking in tongues in these languages. And so Paul, if this is a letter of rebuke, and it is, then is should we take this that this person is being rebuked for speaking in, now notice the singular tongue, which I think also matters, the singular tongue versus the plural tongue. The singular tongue would be how you would describe an ecstatic, almost babbling tongue versus legitimate tongues, which is actual languages. And every time that we've seen this word used, we see it typically used in the plural. So we have him referencing or contrasting the plural versus the singular, it looks like here. Uh, and if that's the case, if that is the case, then for the one who speaks in this singular tongue, this word glosse is the singular. If you notice, it's a feminine singular dative. And so if he's referring to the singular tongue being the wrong way to do so, and in doing so, all you're doing is um, speaking a mystery in his own spirit, not in the spirit, but um, he's just speaking mysteries in, 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 in his spirit. No one knows what he says. For the one who speaks a mis speaks in a tongue, a singular tongue, you don't speak to men, but to God. Well, now let's pause for a second. So far, before we get to chapter 14, all the spiritual gifts, all the giftings, are, we're told that they are to be towards other people, that they are to benefit others. They are for the common good. Could it be that what he's speaking of here, the issue for the rebuke is all you're doing is instead of edifying others, speaking to others, building up others, all you're doing is edifying yourself, speaking to yourself. And no one understands you since you're not speaking to men. But God does. Obviously, he's God. What is that God doesn't understand? So God understands, but no one else does. Is that a problem? Is it a problem? Is it an issue if all you're doing, if you're gifting, or in this case, your, your tongues, no one understands it. It's for God. I mean, only God understands. Because again, we go back to the question, what is the point? What is the purpose of uh, this this particular gifting tongue speaking in these languages. Well, every other time that we've seen it, it is either to testify, well, it's been to testify of the Lord, either to do so for uh, witnessing purposes so that someone could understand the word of God, hear the word of God, hear Christ magnified, or it is a sign to the unbelieving Jews, to unbelievers, to Israel. Well, if it's just you, for example, if those are the cases and those are the only times we've seen the examples of it used, if that is the case, well, then what does it serve for you to be speaking in these languages? Are you are you testifying of Christ in a way that you don't understand? You have no idea what you're saying and you're getting some sort of benefit out of it because no one understands what you're saying. Only God knows what you're saying. Oh, by the way, this is idiomatic of uh, and this is analogous to our idiom that where we say only God knows what he says. Who, who knows what's happening? Only God knows. This is kind of where we get this from. So is this is this the point that Paul is making? Is Paul offering a rebuke? I would say that I think that's what's happening, that he's offering a rebuke because the person that's doing so is only speaking not to men. Only God knows what he's saying uh, for the one who speaks in a singular tongue does not speak to God. I mean, to men, but to God. And the reason why they say that is for no one understands, no one hears, no one understands. But in the spirit, he is speaking mysteries. The idea of us speaking mysteries in the spirit, in his spirit, if it's if it's his spirit, then it's just for him. It's just self-serving. If it's in the spirit, uh, that might still be an issue, but still speaking mysteries in the spirit 
do we have this under do we see this anywhere else where we are to be speaking mysteries in the spirit it's kind of hard to come up with that idea uh, where we see anything else like this, where we are told, we are commanded, or we are shown an example of someone speaking mysteries in the spirit. Where do we speak? Where do human beings speak mysteries in the spirit? And then going in verse three, which is kind of continuing this thought in verse two, but one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and cons consolation. A couple things with going into verse three. We see this, the, uh, the word day, the word but that's used there, and this is used as a word for contrast, not for comparison, but for contrast. Meaning, if I say um, something positive, and then I follow that those positive statements with a but, everything afterwards is expected to be something negative, something different. For example, I would not say about someone uh, she's a nice woman. She's uh, she loves the Lord. Uh, she's a uh, uh, she's devoted to the scriptures. Uh, but well, the but I, I should expect it to be negative. So these are words of this is a word of contrast. When I want to contrast something, I'll use the word. But if I want to compare it, I'll use another another conjunction such as and. But in this case, it's but but the one who prophesies, he speaks to men. Well, is that a good thing? Well, sure, that so far, if you are speaking to men, and in this case, for edification and exhortation and consolation, well, then that's a good thing. So far, that's in keeping with everything we've been told. The purpose of the pneumaticon is for the common good of others, for building up others, for care for one another. And so that's in keeping so far. Verse two, the person that does this singular tongue speaking seems to be not in keeping with what we've understood so far. And what I've done is every time you see a word underlined in blue, this is him speaking of someone being built up. And we cannot walk away and not see that the blue marks are something positive. This is what we're told to do. This is what we're commanded to do. One who speaks in a tongue and by the way, some versions like the King James Version would offer an unknown tongue. Uh, the person speaks in, by the way, this is still singular. The person that speaks in this tongue edifies himself. Uh, is that in keeping with everything that we've read thus far? The issue is everything that we've read thus far, that we've seen, that we've experienced thus far. Doesn't this seem to go against that? Well, sure it does. We've been told that everything that we that we do that we're given from the spirit is to benefit others for the common good of others. Or as Peter says, uh, it is that it's to be employed for serving others. Well, in this case, are we saying that this is to serve ourselves? We have a, we have a spiritual gift that is self-serving. That just doesn't seem right. At least, at least for me, it says the tongue, the one who speaks in a singular tongue edifies himself. But here it is, this word of contrast, but the one who prophesies, and what is prophesying doing? It is telling. It is informing. It's revealing. Well, that makes sense how it would edify other people. And so the one who does so, who prophesies, edifies the church or edifies the body. Now, I wish all of you spoke in tongues. Now, notice the difference. The shift in its plural in languages, because he could have simply, he could have easily used the, the singular for this, but he didn't. But even more, and here it is, but even more that you would prophesy. Well, what we see in verse five is the exact same thing that we see in verse one. He uses this phrase, malan de henna proptuete. I would rather that you spoke in languages, but more rather in order that you prophesy. So what does he want you to speak in these tongues for? in order that you prophesy. What does he say was the point in verse one? Um, pursue spiritual gifts in order that you prophesy. I think the Greek here is fairly clear in showing what the point that Paul is trying to make. Uh, and greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues. And this is plural, unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. So what's the point, even if the person is to do so, I think properly with tongues, speaking in the plural tongues, speaking in these languages, unless he interprets, unless, now what does the word interpret means? De, ermineu, or ermineu, in this case, 
is that you bring about explanation and understanding, interpretation. That's the point. The point is that people would understand what's being stated. But which people? Whoever it is in the hearing. People need to hear the word or else what is the point? And so this is where tongues gets to be on par with prophecy because they're both doing the exact same thing. They are prophesying. They are giving a declaration. They are informing. They are telling. They are uttering. They're bringing a revelation. Brethren, verse 6, but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking, and by the way, if you notice the green, the green, notice every time we see the green, we see those two words put together. And there's a reason why I'm highlighting that because we, we need to make sure that what we're, what we're talking about is the same thing. Because if we want to switch to make tongues to be some something else that it's not, such as a prayer language, which we don't see that, if we want to make it to be a prayer language, it's still using the same two words, lalom, glosize. Okay, so now, brother, if I come to you speaking in tongues or lalom, glosize that we see over here, what will I profit you? Here it is. What if I, how will I profit you? Well, that's why you have the, uh, I have the blue there because it's important to understand that this is speaking about how is this going to benefit you? How is this going to profit you or build you up unless I speak to you either by way of revelation uh, or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? If I don't understand what you're doing, what you're saying, how is the other per how's, how am I going to be benefited? How is the other person going to be benefited if they have no idea, no clue what you're saying? And then he gives an analogy. And I think we too often go past these analogies, the example that he's using. Because he's saying these analogies, this is kind of to help understand what he's saying. Yet even lifeless things, even the flute or a harp in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played? In other words, we need to know what is being played on the flute or the harp. For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, a sound that we don't understand, who will prepare himself for battle? And look what he says. So also, or so it is, this word hutos, this is to say that so it is, or in this way, this is the way also it is with you, unless you utter by the tongue. Now, I put this in white because now this is speaking as far as the, the actual member, the tongue. So unless you utter by the tongue, speech or words that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? The point is, you should know what's being spoken, what's being piped, what's being blown in the bugle or the flute. If you don't know, then there's nothing you can do with it. You want, in other words, Paul says we should know what's coming out for you will be speaking into the air. Here's the question. Paul says for you will be speaking in the air if no one knows what's being spoken. Is that a positive statement? I cannot believe I, it, it's hard to imagine Someone saying you're just all you're doing is just speaking into the air and that be a positive statement. Well, what is that referring to? This is referring to someone speaking and people not knowing what he's saying. I, I hope that part is clear. Paul is stating so far, especially verse 10, if you don't under verse nine up to that point, if you don't understand what's being stated, what's being said, and no one knows then all you're doing is just speaking into the air. No one knows. No one is edified. Uh, no one grows because of that. And so he says in verse 10, there are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world and no kind is without meaning. In other words, there's a meaning to all of these different languages. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. Are those good things? Well, clearly those are not positive things. So if a person doesn't know what's being said, that person is a barbarian to the one who's speaking. Well, what also about the person who's doing it for themselves? Uh, if you don't know, then as Paul says, all you're doing is speaking to the air. Nobody is edified. No one's built up. Only God knows what you're saying. Those are the things that Paul has described so far. So also you, and so that word that's used there again, huta, so it is also with you since you are zealous for pneumatikon, the spiritual things, since you are zealous for those for the for the spiritual things, look what he says: seek to abound for the edification of the church. Paul has never once given anyone a congratulations, a pat on the back, an accommodation for edifying themselves. 
But what he said is seek to uh, the things that are bound for edification of the church, not for yourselves. He doesn't give a pass for you edifying yourself. There is no positive statement anywhere in the scriptures where we can find where it says that it's okay. Anything positive stated about you edifying yourself. However, the focus is on edifying who? Others, the body. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Now, look at the word that's used here again. He should pray that he that he may interpret. He have, and what's the word? Explain, interpret, understand. So the person that's doing so must understand, must be able to explain. Now, I said before, hearkening back to what Peter was doing on the day of Pentecost, the word that's used there, still the same word, this word, Ermineu, which is uh, to explain, to interpret. Paul, Peter's explaining what the prophet is saying. So he's explaining this. And so he's doing the same thing on the day of Pentecost. What, what does Peter ultimately end up doing? Doing exactly what they were doing, what the apostles were doing. When the Spirit came upon them and they began speaking, the problem is there we've got people there who are listening, who hear on, in Acts 2, who hear what, the, what they're saying, but they don't understand. We got the people, we've got people who don't understand and those who do understand. We've got those people who actually understand those languages being spoken, and they tell us what's being spoken, that they are magnifying the Lord. They are telling the good deeds, the good works of the Lord. But the problem is you've got other people there who are just as important, Jews, who don't understand those languages. And then Peter gets up and, and explains to them in their language. Now, I want to come back to this issue of interpretation in a second, because this seems to be the only example. Matter of fact, it's the only example of anyone in the Bible, an example of someone actually bringing about interpretation. If this is not an example of interpretation, well, then that's one spiritual gift that we have no example of. Matter of fact, it would be the only spiritual gift that we have no example of. So now going back to verse 13, he says, therefore, let the one who speaks in a tongue that he may pray that he interprets, that that he interprets. The, the point is that he understands what was Paul just saying in the previous verses that there needs to be understanding, that you need to know, the people need to know, including yourself, you need to understand what it actually is that you're saying. You don't want to be the person who's just speaking into the air. You don't want to be the person where it's only God knows what you're saying. You don't even know what you're saying. So he says, verse 14, look what he says. And then I also think it's important to see what it doesn't say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Now, a couple of things. Corey, you made points to state that there's a difference between the singular tongue and the plural tongue. But here is a singular tongue. Well, if Paul said, now Paul is stating, making this point. Now, there's a couple of ways you can take this. Is Paul saying that if a person were to pray in a tongue? Paul Now, Paul's not saying that he does. He says, if I pray in a tongue. Now, it could be that, hey, it, it, we can pray in a tongue. It could be that Paul is saying that you guys are praying in tongues and then it makes no sense. Uh, or it could be that he is just kind of magnifying the Lord in this sense. Now, I think that he's that he's speaking uh, in terms of if, because the word that if is used, eon is the word for if. So if I pray now, I think he's speaking not even necessarily of himself. Um, I think he's just speaking kind of whomever. If I pray in a tongue, you know how you say, well, if I do that, then, and I'm talking about what you do, that might be kind of the sense that Paul is speaking here, but he says, if I pray in a tongue, look what he says. And what Paul is doing is Paul is presenting a problem. So it's kind of hard to see that Paul is saying that he does this, this same way, because what Paul is talking about is a problem. And he says, so if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. The question is, is that okay? Is that good that the mind is unfruitful? There's never such time where it's okay for the mind of a person uh, for them to be unfruitful, whether they're praying or just speaking or doing anything. Now, remember, the word that's used here is the word news, which is for the word mind. Paul said earlier that I don't want you to be unknowing or unmindful or ignorant. That's what he said in chapter 12, verse 1 concerning these spiritual things. I don't want you to be ignorant. We know that's a problem because here, Paul is going to have a solution. You don't have a solution unless you have a problem. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? What then? 
ten un esten. What uh, what then is or what is it? What's the problem? What how do we fix this? Is is what Paul said? He says, I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say I will pray in with uh, in tongues or with the tongue with an understanding. He says I will pray with the spirit. In other words, it and with under and, and with my mind also. So is that to be in contrast to uh, with praying in tongues? I think so. I think Paul is bringing up this issue, this contrast of the person that prays in in a, uh, in the spirit, and his mind is unfruitful. And the solution is to pray with understanding, uh, pray uh, with the spirit and then pray with his mind also. Now, some are going to want to naturally take that praying in the spirit means to pray in tongues. That is not the case. If you want to take this phrase in the spirit, uh, well, we've got a problem because every time we see in the spirit, then we would have to associate it the same way. Every time, every other time, and I mean every other time that we see in the spirit, it has nothing to do with tongues. Every other time that we see in the spirit, it has to do with by the power, by the authority, in accordance with, alongside with. That's all it ever means. And because we've got other passages that would say, so when David is speaking, uh, is David doing something in the spirit? Is is Did John come um, uh, in the spirit? Did he come in tongues? No. So that's not what it means. It's never meant that. And again, we cannot start a brand new understanding of a word or a phrase just to suit us, just because now all of a sudden in 1 Corinthians 14, in one verse, that's what it means in that one verse. But every other verse that we see it, it doesn't mean that. Now, there's another passage that I'll go to because someone might want to say, well, wait a second. Jude offers some insight, but it doesn't. Praying in the spirit and edifying yourself uh, is not what Jude is, is saying. But we'll come to that. And I mean by how he's how, how he means this in Jude. We'll, come, we'll go there in a second. But he says, what is the outcome? What's the what's the solution? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. The same word for, for mind, no way for mind. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. In other words, with understanding. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, if you or if you bless in the spirit, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at your giving thanks? Since he does not know, look at the point that he's making, since he does not know what you're saying. For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not what? Edify, which is why it's highlighted in blue, because the goal is for the person to be edified. It is possible for a person to say something ignorantly, but mean well. A person could be um, doing so to bless the Lord. Someone can be doing so to, to try to magnify the Lord and have no idea what they're saying, be all over the place, but only, which is why he says, only the Lord knows what you're saying. Only the Lord what you, knows what you're trying to do. But you yourselves don't know, which is why Paul says, how about you just do it with understanding? How about you do it with your mind? And also that way, the person that hears will also be edified. I thank God I speak in languages more than you. Well, that makes sense. Paul uh, is an educated person. He spoke in various languages. He spoke in Hebrew. He spoke in Greek. He spoke in Latin. And doubtfully, um, he also, more than likely, he spoke in other languages as well. So he says, I spoke, I, I speak in languages more than all of you. Now, again, notice the words that are bit, that are used here. Glossis, lalo. So he, he, the same two words that we saw in Mark that we saw in the first in First Corinthians twelve, that we saw in Acts two, that we saw in Acts ten as well. These are the same words that we that we're seeing, and these words then meant speaking in languages. And so when we see it in First Corinthians fourteen, then it also stand the reason that if they've always if they previously meant speaking in languages, then wouldn't they also mean speaking in languages right now? If not, we would need some sort of justification to see why these two words, that the meanings are pretty straightforward, why they all of a sudden don't mean what they've always meant. However, in the church, verse 19, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I might instruct, might instruct others. Again, the benefit is for others uh, rather than 10,000 words in a tongue, singular tongue. 
And so I think the point is people need to know what's being stated. You need to know what's being stated. Now, we're going to find out some more good information coming from Paul that brings some that shed some more light on this. He says, brethren, don't do not be children in your thinking yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. In other words, in your thinking, you need to understand. You need to be adults. You need to be grown up about this. He says in the law, it is written. Now, here it is by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people. And even so, they will not listen to me. Why would he ever bring this up? Well, this refers back to a passage in Isaiah, tw back in Isaiah 28. I believe. Now he goes on and he's quoting a passage from Isaiah 28. So I want to go to Isaiah 28. I want to start right before that particular passage, which is Isaiah 28, 11. I want to start in verse nine. He said, now he's speaking to Israel. If we go look at, at Isaiah, even Paul, as he's quoting Isaiah, often he's speaking about Isaiah not turning to, their, to her Messiah. Uh, and then what is going to happen eventually? Paul in Romans 9, 10, 11, his issue is that Israel is, has has turned away from the Messiah, not listening. But God has made them jealous. God is going to make them jealous. He's going to provoke them to come back to her or I'm sorry, come back to him, provoke Israel to come back to him. And that Israel needs to have someone to preach. And that's what he, that's what his, his whole point is in uh, Romans 10. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall a preacher, how shall they hear unless a preacher be sent? And there's this report that they need to hear. Well, where's the report going to come from? The report is going to come from someone giving them this word, teaching them, bringing about this knowledge, this revelation to them. And so in Isaiah 28, which is what Paul is quoting about these tongues uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, he brings up Isaiah 28. So starting in verse 9, he says, to whom would he teach knowledge and to whom would he interpret the message? Those just weaned from milk? those just taken from the beast for he says order on order order on order line on line line on line a little here a little there indeed here it is and he will speak to this people through the stammering lips and foreign tongues now i want you to notice the words that are used here this is this is pretty important as a matter of fact let me go ahead and move the hebrew over because i want you to see the greek here as well because we talked about the words that we've been using we've been seeing these two words lalon and glass and glossas. And so we see those exact same words too here. And we know he's speaking about an actual language because he says through the languages, other language, be, uh, and though, because they're speaking uh, to the people. So we see the words that are used. These So he will speak. And that is a uh, alone. They are speaking through the stammering lips. Uh, now that's where we get the word uh, xilos, which I'm sorry, xilos, which we saw earlier, the lips of these people. Uh, and he's speaking about them speaking in this foreign tongue or this foreign language through the languages of others, this foreign language. And so clearly what he's speaking here has to do with these foreigners are going to speak and what's going to happen. They won't listen. Indeed, he will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. He who said to them, here is the rest, give, re give rest to the weary and here is repose, but they would not listen. So the word of the Lord uh, to them will be order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there, that they may go and stumble backwards, be broken, snared and taken captive. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, O scoffers who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we have made a pact. Now, the whole point that he's making is that I'm going to even bring people who speak a different language. And you still won't even listen to them and you're going to fall. You're going to stumble backwards, but not you won't you won't die totally. The whole all of Israel won't be taken away, won't won't lose um, because he said, I'm, I'm going to use them to make you jealous. Remember the, the entire big picture that God is trying to bring. God is not using these different spiritual gifts or these different spiritual things just for the sake of using, just for showing off. There is a purpose. The purpose is to magnify him. And in doing so, people hear the gospel, they hear what's being stated, and Israel is pricked, but they're first made jealous, and it serves as a sign that God is using other people. And they then eventually, as we get to Isaiah 53, they will eventually come around. All of Israel, no, a great deal will be lost, but still the point is being made of what God is trying to do. And so he's clearly speaking about 
actual language is. So when we go back to Isaiah, I mean, First uh, Corinthians 14, when he makes this point, he says, "In the law it is written by men of strange tongues, and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people." So we know he's speaking about it, speaking in tongues, speaking in languages, and even so, they will not listen to me. So again, and just to reiterate this point, every time we've seen these two words used, every time we've seen glossize or glossa used, it is speaking actual languages. And so even when we see the first time that these two words, um, la, la, leo and glossa used in Isaiah, he's speaking about them speaking actual languages. So then... Look what he says. So then, uh, tongues or glossi are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Well, who are the unbelievers? Those people that will come in, they will hear this with the unbeliever as he's relating this. This relates to verse 21. Verse 21 is speaking about Israel. Israel will have this sign, not to the believers, not to, to Gentiles, but to the unbelieving Israel will see this sign and it will bother them. Uh, it will make them jealous. It will make them angry. Uh, so then, so then languages are for a sign. Again, what, what has languages always been? What has this word always been? Either the actual uh, member. Well, that can't be a sign for Israel, but languages is the other definition for this word. And so if you speak in a language, that will, that will get their attention. What do we see in Acts 10, 44? Gentiles speak it in these languages, and what happened? The Jews see and hear it, and they marvel. They are amazed that even they have this. Now, had it been just gibberish, had it been babbling, had it been some sort of ecstatic language, they don't, they're not marveling at that. They're, because then to them, maybe they will think this is just someone rambling. But no, in this case, in this place, there it's a it's a true actual language, and it serves as a sign to Israel. So continuing, he says, but prophecy is a sign for not, is, is a sign not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. And so this is for the people who are going to believe or who are, who are believing. Uh, that is the, the revelation, the, the uttering, the informing, the telling. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in a tongue. So here's the word, la, la say. Glossi, so we have those two words again, and the ungifted or the ignorant. Now, interestingly enough, the word that's used here is, is uh, idioti, which is where we get the word idiot. The person that's ungifted, unlearned, un doesn't know, that person walks in, uh, and ungifted men or unbelievers enter. Will they not say that you are mad? Um, but if all prophesy, if all are declaring the word of the Lord, if all are giving a revelation, informing, tell you, if people are doing that, uh, an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account. So let's break this down for a second. F the tongues for the person, the languages for the person who is Jewish, um, that's a sign to them. You walk in and if an unbeliever walks in and hears, and hears these tongues, let's say he's not a Jew, doesn't do anything for him. It's not a sign unless unless you are giving it to him in his language, which we see in Acts 2. But then again, in Acts 2, we see these are languages to people who are Jewish. And so a point could be made. And I've heard folks make this point. And I don't have a problem with this either. If they're saying that when this is used evangelistically, it's used evangelistically only to to the Jews, meaning and the only time, as a matter of fact, that we've ever seen it used evangelistically uh, is in Acts 2. They are giving, they're giving uh, the Lord being magnified in their languages and it works for those Jews. And so for some of those Jews, it, it is an evangelistic tool. And for other two, uh, for other Jews, uh, it becomes a sign, a judgment sign against them because many of them, what do they do? They, they mock and then they give them now, now Peter gets up and others do the same thing and give them the word in their own language. In other words, they're prophesying they are informing, they are telling, they are declaring uh, about the Lord. And in that way, they, their hearts get pricked. And so though, and so I don't have a problem with someone saying the only way that it's used evangelistically is for Jews. I don't have a problem with that. I do think though that if there, and there are people who on this planet, they are um, 
people who we don't know much about. We know they're there, but we don't know their language. We don't know their culture. We kind of can't keep our distance. So if God wants to bring them the gospel, well, then uh, he's going to have to uh, bring someone in that's going to bring revelation. Uh, and it possibly you would either have to learn the language or supernaturally be given their language. I don't know how God would do that. I leave that up to him. But the point that he's making here in 23 is when people come in, they need to hear if they if they're hearing someone declaring the goodness of the Lord that saves people all throughout the scripture. What has saved people has been the power of the gospel. That's why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. And so in this case, if all prophesy and an unbeliever or ungifted man comes in, he is convicted by all. Like we saw on the day of Pentecost, he is called to account by all. It's not a prophecy like where someone will say, and we've seen this, where someone says, the Lord told me to tell you your back hurts uh, or that God is going to start blessing you financially. No, it's not that kind of prophecy. Remember, the overwhelming majority of prophecy in the Bible is forth telling right now what things are, the situation is on the ground, how things actually are, not what's going to be. And so that person can then be convicted. Why? Because it's the power of the gospel that then turns around and convicts their heart. People know that they are, uh, they need saving. People know that they're not very good. People know that they have sin in their lives. And so uh, they then, if they if their heart has been uh, uh, touched by the Lord, that person will then um, place his faith in Christ. But he can only place his faith in Christ if there is some revelation, if there is some preached word. And so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a song, has a teaching. Each one has a revelation. Each one has a tongue. Each one has an interpretation. He says, let all things be done for edification. And there it is again. Everything should be done for what? Everything. Now notice this point. Let all things be done. Matter of fact, panta pras uh, which is all things are to be done. All things are to be done. Matter of fact, let me look at something for a second. All things are to be done. Matter of fact, I don't, there's no, there's actually not even a subjunctive. So we can even remove the let because let is not here. All to the building up uh, to be done. And it's in the, it's in the imperative. So it's not even a, um, uh, a suggestion. Let's do these things. May these may everything be done to build up. No, this is a command. This is the command here. Uh, all things are to be done to edify everyone. Everything should be done. Whatever is done should be done in order to edify all people. That's why the word pontize here. And so what it, the issue is you doing things to edify yourself goes counter to what Paul is saying. And oh, by the way, let's stop with everyone always having to show some sort of particular gift. Look what I've got today. Look, I've got a word from the Lord today. I've got an explanation over here. I want to explain what this means. I want to do this. I want to do that. I've got this this new tongue. Let me show this off. That Paul is saying, don't do that. What you should do rather is to edify, let everything do something that edifies the body, not yourself. If anyone speaks in a tongue, there it is again, those two words speaking in tongues. So notice what we're saying here, what we're seeing here. We're seeing the same two words being used, the same two words is always being used, and the definition has not changed. And so anyone that comes back later today and says, no, the definition means also this. Where? Give an example. You have all of Genesis to Revelation to give an example of where it means. And I'm saying in this passage, not this passage, but let's say earlier, uh, you're going to say, for example, verse two, it means this. Well, wait a second. We dis- we dispute verse two. Is there anywhere else that you can turn to to show that verse two means this? Because I could show or go to every other passage where the words are used, where it refers to something that's opposite, where it refers to it being an actual known language. And so if anyone speaks in a language, it should be by two or at most three and each in turn. And and one must interpret. Somebody, somebody has to interpret. If you've got two or three doing this, somebody has to interpret. Could it be the same person? It could be. There's no prohibition against that. Could it be someone different? But again, the word that's used here is someone has to bring about uh, uh, understanding and explanation. Otherwise, as we talked about earlier, no one gets edified. It's just you being the center of attention because here we are listening to you 
Speak in something that we have no idea what you're saying. Verse 28, but if there is no interpreter, if there's no explanation, no one to bring about explanation, he must keep silent in the church. He must keep silent in the church. Now, this is kind of as a as a rebuke. That person ought to be quiet and there should be some shame to that person. Unfortunately, we don't do that. Why? Because other people are doing the exact same thing, speaking out of turn in the this ecstatic babbling tongue. No one knows what's being stated. And so there's just nothing but disorder rather than trying to uplift and build up everyone else. I don't mean uplift and build up everyone else by saying that God is going to bless you with a new car or he's going to um, bless you with newfound riches. No, that's not what he's speaking of. He's speaking of building up by the word of God. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent uh, in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Be quiet. Speak to yourself and to God. Inquire of the Lord. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. In other words, well, here's the same word. Uh, let others judge what's being stated. So if you say something, you give some sort of prophecy, okay, we can take that into account. Let's think about what he just said. Let's pass judgment. Not, not that we have to judge the person. We're judging what was stated. And he says, but if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first must first one must keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one. In other words, we can all give a revelation, which makes sense. The spirit comes upon you and you can give a revelation. You can give or you can tell inform or tell but there still has to be some sort of order so that all may look what he says so that all may learn and all may be exhorted remember we're talking about the same thing this building up and the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets for god is not a god of confusion this is what god wants he's not he wants order not disorder but of peace as in all the churches of the saints now Someone brings this point up where it says that do not forbid the speaking in tongues. Do not forbid that. Well, again, drop down to verse 39. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. Desire earnestly to prophesy. That's in keeping with what we saw earlier uh, in order that you would prophesy to bring about a revelation, to tell, to utter, to inform. Uh, and do not forbid Speaking in tongues, the same two words that are used there, speaking in tongues, the Greek word for speaking, lalein, and tongues, plural, glossize, um, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. That is his point that he's trying to bring about in these tongues. Now, I want to go to a passage really briefly. I want to go to Jude because there's a part of Jude that people think it's saying one thing and it's really not. I spoke earlier when I said that there is no pastor that teaches, that tells us to edify ourselves. And someone said, well, what about Jude 20? Well, Jude 20 may look as though it says that, but it's not. Uh, when he says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, before we get to the building yourselves up, praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit. Again, we don't have a right to state that praying in the Spirit means praying in tongues. If that's the case, then everybody must pray in tongues. Everybody must speak in tongues. The reason why this can't mean praying in tongues is because Paul has already told us that all of us don't speak in tongues. Not all, may pontes, which is not all, um, speak in tongues. So we've been told that not all will speak in tongues, but then you can't come back and say that everyone will pray in tongues. That's how you build yourself up, by praying in tongues. And if only certain people can pray in tongues or speak in tongues, then what about the rest of us who can't or the rest of those who cannot? Because now we've got um, a we've got an issue. We've got almost second class citizens in the body, those who can build themselves up and those who cannot build themselves up. They have to rely on something else. And we just don't have that. We don't have all the spiritual gifts are for everyone else. But this specific spiritual gift is for only the person to build themselves up. So now tongues go from building up others to just building up yourself. Where was this shift made? Uh, because previously speaking in tongues, lifted up the body, built the body up. There were more folks added to the body, but now it has shifted to building up yourself. Now, the reason why I brought up earlier the dates of the writings of these scriptures is because if first Corinthians 14, two is for you to build yourself up, but now first Corinthians 4, 12, is for you to build up others. And then Acts 2, 
I'm sorry, every other passage prior to that uh, has to do with you building the body up. So every time that tongues are spoken, every time that spiritual gifts are employed is to build up you. Then we get to 1 Corinthians 14, is to, I mean, to build up others. Then we get to 1 Corinthians 14, is to build up you. Then we get to Acts 2 and Acts 10, everywhere else, is to build up others. Remember, because Acts 2 or Acts was written after 1 Corinthians 14. So chronologically speaking, we've got for everybody else, for everybody else, every other gift is for everybody else, but then we get to Acts 14. I mean, 1 Corinthians 14 now is for you, and then everything else is for before and after 1 Corinthians 14, the spiritual gifts, specifically tongues, are to build up others, but just as one passage is to build up yourselves. And Jude 20 is not telling you to build up yourselves, because look at what, what it's saying. But you, now notice this is, is the plural. So this hamas is the plural. So you all, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith. So what is he saying? Building yourselves up. Now, it is also in the plural. Um, so it's you all building yourselves up. In other words, you all looking towards others, building each other up, building up others. Because again, what is the command? To build up others. So here we do not have Jude saying build yourself up because it's not in the singular. It is in the plural. You, y'all, build up y'all selves, others. That's the whole point. Um, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the spirit. And again, praying in the spirit does not refer to praying in tongues because then if that's the case, Jude can only be speaking to certain people. He could not be speaking to all of us, just those who have the ability to speak in tongues. Because again, speaking in tongues is the same as praying in tongues. We know speaking in tongues and praying in tongues are the same because it's the exact same two words that are being used. We don't have it used anywhere else. And so the question is going to be, are tongues a prayer language? We don't see so. The two words that are used whether it being praying um, or speaking or whatever you want to say, the, the same two words that are used when it comes to tongues is praying. I mean, it's speaking in tongues. And we know what the word tongues has always meant, languages. And so if, if these are languages, uh, the purpose of it is to uplift Christ, to magnify the Lord, to bring people, to bring, to build the body up, uh, to also be a sign. Well, then, amen. Even this particular gift is to build up the body. That's what Paul says. If you want to strive for any of the spiritual giftings, do so in building up the body. And then we can't forget that he says that we do so in order that we bring about a revelation, in order that we prophesy, in order that we proclaim, in order that we utter. Tell. And that's going to be a problem for some people because when they hear this, wait a second, prophesy does not mean to, uh, to proclaim. Yes, it does. It means to tell. You can tell in various ways. You can inform. You can. It means inform, to tell, to utter, to give a revelation. Uh, this proclamation is exactly what we're talking about. What are we proclaiming? What are we telling? What are we uttering? What are we revealing? The goodness of the Lord. We are magnifying the Lord because, again, that's what Jesus tells the disciples. That's what we see all throughout the scriptures. As a matter of fact, going back to Moses, would that all of God's people have the Spirit upon them and then prophesy? So now we come full circle to 1 Corinthians 14, desire the spiritual things, the things of the spirit, in order that you prophesy. So now, this has been pretty long, uh, and I, I, I intend to kind of be a little bit thorough. We could go through even more. We could probably spend even more hours. And as a matter of fact, what's probably required is that we have a Q&A to even address some of those things. Because some folks will say, well, wait a second, what about this? Or what about that? I think we have covered pretty much everything there is to cover. Uh, and again, when you look at all of the scriptures as we go through this, one of the things I thought was, was pretty interesting is when I go through uh, and just looking up whenever this word is used, and, and, I, and I thought it was pretty helpful looking at the Old Testament, just, just scrolling through all of these passages, all of these uh, times that we see it in the Bible, in the Old Testament, as I'm just scrolling through this, there's just not one time where it means something different than how I've come to understand it, meaning that there's not one time where we see the scriptures referring to it being an angelic language, a heavenly language. We haven't seen it being something that you do for the edification of yourself. We've never seen it used that way. And again, we've never seen it really the, the other gifts being uh, the time of the Spirit comes upon someone. We've never really seen that be to where 
It only uh, is used for yourself to edify yourself. We just haven't seen that. But we do see the promise of the Spirit come upon people so that they would be used to do what? To magnify the Lord. As a matter of fact, uh, if we go, let me just go right back up and look at the New Testament examples of this particular word. Uh, if I click on it, and then every time that we see it in 50, it still it still refers to one of two things, um, be it the actual organ in the mouth or an actual language. Uh, Mark 7, 33, Jesus took him aside by the crowd and put his fingers into his ear. And, and after spitting, he touched his tongue. So that there is the actual member. So those are the only times we see it as the member. But then here we see it. In Mark 16, 17, these signs will accompany those and says they will speak with new tongues. So in this case, it's a language. Uh, those are the only times that we've seen it. And so, again, it's just hard to come away and thinking that this means something other than what we've always thought. Because the problem is, who who, who told someone that? If you, were, if you were around at that time and you were, let's say, in the church of Philippi or you were in the church of... Uh, Galatia, if, if you were somewhere else, if, if you were uh, in Laodicea and you heard about this phenomenon and you know what the word speaking means and you know what the word tongues mean, it means languages, but then all of a sudden it has a different meaning, a new meaning, a more nuanced meaning. The question is, where, where are the cheat sheets? Where are the cheat codes? Who told us? Where do we get this? to know that it means something altogether different. Because what we don't have is, after these writings, after the few times, and by the way, we only have Acts 2. If you want to say Acts 8, that's fine, but there's no real description of Acts 8, so we'll leave Acts 8 alone. But Acts 2, uh, Acts 10, and Acts 19, 1 Corinthians 12, and 1 Corinthians 14. And we have it mentioned in Isaiah 28, and then also Mark. So there's those seven times that we see it. Uh, one is a full chapter. Well, actually two is a full chapter. But that's it. We don't see Peter uh, addressing this. We don't see James addressing this. We don't see John addressing it. We only see Paul addressing it in just 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Uh, we don't see anyone else addressing this. And so Sometimes we might we might be too guilty of putting too much of an emphasis. And I think, again, it's because it is a valued spiritual gift the way that other people see it. They think that it's a valued spiritual gift. And so what happens is people want to do that and they in turn end up um, manufacturing maybe what they've been told, what tongues are. And so we see this more and more because you think about it, the gift that's used more often than anything else is going to be tongues more than prophecy, more than healing, more than helps, more than mercy, more than anything else. That is the gift that seems to be in operation more than any other gift. That makes you wonder, huh, how is that? And how is it that those who do it in a false fashion look just like those that do it? If there is, if there is someone that's doing it in a legitimate fashion, how come they look alike? I would love to see an action. I've been asking for this, an actual video of someone showing uh, legitimate tongues that we see it in the Bible and then also being accompanied by someone explaining it. This is what I would like. To, I haven't seen one yet. People will say, well, uh, I've done it. I've seen it. I've heard it. But with all the cameras, all the cell phones with video cameras, we just never really see it, do we? We'll see someone saying, well, there, there's an example of tongues. But wait a second, your tongues look just like my tongues. And I know my tongues were were not were not legitimate. So there in lies the question. Now, so I'm going to say, well, I'm not convinced, Corey. I think it's I think this is a prayer language for the person. That's fine. I would just caution you that if it is your prayer language, if you think it's a prayer language, well, then and, and it doesn't require interpretation, which the Bible says it does. But fine, if it doesn't, if you think it doesn't, well, then it should be done privately by yourself. But the moment that we hear it, it's no longer prayer language. It's something that is made for public consumption and the public needs to know about it. So if you're going to pray in your so-called prayer college closet, which is fine, um, the issue is if you did that, one, no one would ever know. Two, no one could hold you accountable. So let's do things the right way according to the scriptures.
if there's disagreement, and I'm sure there will be some disagreement, someone's going to say, nah, Corey, I disagree with, with everything that you have said. That's fine. That is fine. I'd want to show someone to give some sort of legitimacy to the background of the scriptures. Where in scripture do we see that tongues mean something other than what I've explained? Now, again, it's not a reason for us to uh, fight and to dislike each other or to hate each other or to do the name calling. Uh, what we can do is attempt to go through the scriptures uh, in an honest fashion with an open mind. And let's just see, I could be, I can be reconvinced that all the time in the very beginning, I was right after all. Uh, and so Corey, when you changed your mind, when you thought that you were convinced that uh, your understanding of tongues was different, uh, you, you had it right. I don't have a problem with, <laughs> with that. You just have to show me. And I think I have to show you, I, hopefully I've done so for, for some people. I hope that's the case. Uh, but if not, hey, amen. Um, but at least it's an opportunity. It causes us to go back into the scriptures, ask more questions, do more digging. That's fine. If we got to go start from Genesis and work our way on. Amen.